Welcome to Flint's Original Decision 2020. I'm Zach Lino. I'm going to be your host as we cover some of the election results. And we're going to be asking a couple of local and state politicians about a little bit of political discourse and the events of 2020. Hi, I'm Zach Lino. I'm the moderator for our little talk of political discourse today. Welcome to Frontier Decision 2020. Um, we're going to start off with the first question here. So I was just curious, um, how is the current political climate, you know, very bipartisan, um, you could say toxic you know, political environment, how has it affected you so far, and if it has at all? Personally? Um well, I come from a different part of the country. I come from a very red state. So uh, where I'm from, I have a lot of relatives on social media that are posting a lot of toxic stuff. Um, and you know, I have, I have friends that post things from the left as well, but I have a lot of really right-wing friends and family that back west that, uh, that, that post things on, on social media. And it just got so toxic and divisive with like different friends from high school and college and like family members that I finally, I deleted my Facebook account um, because I just got tired of just the anger and the hostility that I was receiving. You know, I, I had it as a way to keep in touch with my family and friends back where I'm from, but um, it got to the point where I just felt like it was a little too toxic. So I, I got rid of that and that was, you know, I had to adapt, um, but you know, just, personally, it's been a little stressful, you know, because uh, I have uh, friends and family from both sides of like the political aisle that uh, have different views, and they don't always jive. So it's, it's been a little challenging that way. Um, social media has kind of contributed to this bipartisan, very polarized political climate. I would absolutely say so. Um, yeah, that's one of the reasons why I decided to leave Facebook is because uh not only was there a lot of divisiveness, there's a lot of misinformation being spread. And, um, you know, that's really important to be able to learn how to realize and, and disseminate information and realize what's disinformation and what comes from factual sources. And unfortunately, you know, I, I don't feel like a lot of the social media companies are doing a very good job at making that differentiation. People are making claims about whatever they want and not backing it up with any kind of evidence. And as we know, that. It doesn't really uh, um, lend itself for, um, you know, like having good information out there. I think you brought up an interesting point about the whole social media companies having to monitor almost misinformation from free speech. Do you think that there's um, a slippery slope that tends to happen when you start to kind of force these social media companies to regulate what's factual, what's not? Um, I don't think it's a slippery slope. I think it's a social responsibility. I think the social media companies, you know, they have they have a responsibility to at least label misinformation and let people know, okay, this is not a substantiated from a substantiated source or this is conspiracy theory. Um, and there are like value, valid information and different viewpoints. I mean, you can make like a left wing or a right wing argument without using information disinformation you don't have to use disinformation to get a valid point across so if like there's a lot of and we also know there's foreign actors that are that are posting um on social media um trying to interfere with our elections so yeah i do absolutely think it's a social responsibility for them to at least label the content not so much censorship but you know just to keep people informed because unfortunately most people are getting their news on social media and so that's okay it's just there's a fine line between getting your news there and just believing everything you say and it's you know everything that's said on social media that can be i think that's a slippery slope uh, obviously we're going to pivot here a little bit on the next question so obviously 2020 it's been definitely a different kind of year with coronavirus pandemic um you have the blm movement that's come up after the tragic death of george floyd um, passing of Ruth Bader Ginsburg, on and on. Many huge events have happened this year. 
um, and obviously many pressing concerns. What do you think is the number one voting issue that's going to happen this year? Why, what do you think the number one issue that's going to drive the most people to the polls, whether it be economy, immigration, climate? Um, yeah, that, that's a tough one because there's so many things. Like, Are you asking what I think is most important or what do I think is actually what, driving what, what do you think the country as a whole, if you had to poll them, would rank as the number one issue? Um, that's a good question. I think right now it's pretty clearly the pandemic. Um, right now, uh, you know, we're in the middle of this thing. Um, the numbers in the United States are not good. Uh, there's a very sharp debate on different sides about who is responsible for those numbers. I mean, you know, and to be fair around the world, every single country around the world has had to balance this question of the economy versus keeping people safe. Where do you draw the line? Does there need to be a national response versus a state response? Um, so far, the approach has been, okay, let's be have a state response, but let's gently or not so gently <laughs> nudge states to, to reopen quickly. Um, and there's been consequences for that. And so the, I really think that this election is a referendum on the pandemic at this point, because uh, you know before the pandemic, it was really shaping up like this election would be a referendum on the economy. And you know now that we're in the middle of this of the pandemic, and we're we're pushing, we're getting to the point where we've almost had as many people die from this pandemic that died in World War II. I mean that that just blows my mind. Um, so this is absolutely about the pandemic at this point. I think that's obviously probably going to hurt the incumbent president, no matter really what political way they swing. Um, do you think it's going to encourage more people to switch from? the right wing perspective over to a left wing perspective, or do you think it's not going to really matter along party lines? It's just going to, everybody's going to be kind of voting on that issue. Well, I can, I can speak um, from experience, you know, like I said, I've, I've got a lot of friends from all different sorts of perspectives. The people that are on the right, they're there. They are firm with their support of the incumbent president. They believe he's doing the right thing. Um, and they feel like he's been handling things well. The people who are on the left are adamantly opposed to the approach. They don't like it. They probably wouldn't have liked it no matter what happened. However, the ones, you know, we, we saw this in the 2016 election. Um, the people that really decide the election were those undecided voters, those people in the middle that decided at the last minute to vote for Donald Trump over Hillary Clinton. And, um, you know, like it's, it's going to be the people in the middle that decide this election. You know, the people in the middle, the, the, the more center part of America that maybe are, you know, center right or center left, or maybe right down the center. They're, they're the ones that are going to really decide this. I don't think it's going to change anybody's mind, but I think um, the people in the middle, uh, as in most elections, they're the ones that are really going to decide this. Obviously, it does come down to huge few swing states with mixed demographics that could swing the election one way or the other. Um, I'm a little curious about the whole electoral college debate versus the popularity vote debate. Do you think that the electoral college should be reformed, abolished, stay the same? Because there's been some debate, especially after 2016, of where the candidate, again, with a popular vote for, I believe, the third or fourth time in U.S. history, didn't win the election. Well, to be clear, if we look at back at the history of the United States of America and why we have the electoral college, the electoral college was set up to appease like smaller states so that they would sign onto the, the U.S. Constitution. I mean, when they set forth to reform the Articles of Confederation and they decided to scrap them, let's go with a brand new constitution, there was a lot of different parties out there. And by parties, I mean groups of people that needed a bone to be thrown to them. And some of those people were in the South where they had a small white population and they also had a sizable slave population. And in those Southern states, um, these, people, you know, that owned other human beings, they wanted those that those people they considered to be property to count towards their electoral college vote to give them more of a population. That's where we get the three fifths compromise, which counts slaves as three fifths of a, of a human being towards like the census and distributing like the electoral college votes. And that's why you have this really big disproportionate like um, way of counting votes in America. I mean, Wyoming has 500, 
thousand some odd people, but it has three electoral votes. You know, um, DC has more people, Washington DC has more people in it than Wyoming, but they have no representation in Congress. So yeah, there needs to be some reform happening. This is an archaic system that was set up for different reasons and we've held on to it. But now really what we've seen in the last several elections is a system that ignores the majority. And is that okay? Is that what we want? Do we want rural America to have a bigger voice than the actual population? Well, that depends on your perspective. And I'm not gonna take one side of that or another, but the majority of the people in two of the last three like incumbent like uh, elections, when we saw that in, in 2000 and then again in 2016, um, yeah, the, two out of the three times we've ever seen this happen have been in this century. So yeah, it's an issue. There needs, it needs to be revisited. The topic to discuss. Um, we'll move on to the next one. We talked about the coronavirus handling with the president, obviously huge death total now totaling over 230,000 dead American lives. Um, a lot of people are angry, but the president has claimed that it's justified as the economy is climbed back very quickly. Do you think that's an appropriate response? Um, well, we're talking dollars versus human lives. So, you know, I, I feel like, you know, it's this final, and I'm going to go back to what I talked about before. Every country in the world has had to weigh its economy versus the safety of its citizens. Where do you draw the line? There are countries that have done a much better job than we have. Um, now, I'm not going to say like necessarily scrap that and go back to that. Okay. Um, so there are countries all over the world, like I said before, countries all over the world have had to respond to the coronavirus in a different way. And um, some countries have done a lot better job than we have. And you, you've got to balance, like I said before, you got to balance um, the economy versus the safety of the citizens. Do we have to compromise? Do we have to let people die in order to preserve the economy? Or can we find another way to do this so that people can be safe and we can grow our economy and open things up in a safe way? Like if we, we know masks work, the science is clear. It's work, you know, it's come down to masks. You know, we, we know it's airborne, masks work. They, they can stop the spread of this virus. There needs to be like on both sides of the aisle, a full court press of like getting people just socially distance and, and to wear masks and do the things that we know work. And I think we're seeing that at Frontier. Right now we're in the middle of, you know, we're up to, you know, like the next phase of our hybrid, um, protocol at the school and things seem to be going pretty good. Like I really feel safe at school. Um, so I do think there's a safe way to do this. There's a right way to do this and there's a wrong way to do this. Um, we don't have to compromise safety to, to preserve the economy. You talked about students there very briefly at the end. That's where we're going to kind of pivot this next question. Obviously, we know the pandemic has greatly affected teachers and students, but do you think this election cycle as a whole, the year 2020, this whole political movement, the whole re-election of the president, whether or not goes successfully or not, Supreme Court judges, everything that's been moving politically in this rapid succession, do you think that has affected students? And if so, how? Okay, so are you talking about the um, the political climate or the outcome of the election? I'm talking more, more about this election cycle, whether the Trump is reelected or is not, and you know, down ballot initiatives, obviously have question one, question two. Do you think any of this is gonna affect students? And if so, how? Oh, it's gonna affect students tremendously. Um, I mean, let's let's be clear. I mean, there's there's been a lot of things that have been talked about um, by uh, like, for example, um, Vice President Joe Biden has, you know, talked about like healthcare. He's talked about like, um, college and, and funding college education. Um, these things are on the Democratic Party platform. Um, so, you know, like whether you agree with the Democratic Party platform or you don't agree with it, that's up to you. That's OK. But for the first time, we've we have a, a candidate without a platform like Donald Trump has not come up with a platform for the 2020 election. So you kind of just kind of go got to go off of what you're seeing. All right. And um, so far, what we're seeing is, um, 
you know, like a lot of emphasis on the economy, a lot of emphasis on, on now, um, a lot of emphasis, like he's uh, talked about rolling back payroll tax cuts. And, uh, so, um, you know, if it, it really depends. And I guess my whole point is you, you have two candidates, one of them you can go on, and I'm not taking a side here. All right, let me be clear about that. I'm not taking a side. However, you can go online and, and see what the uh, the platform is for uh, one candidate, and you there's no platform for the other one, and that's never happened before. And so um, how is it going to affect your future? There's a question mark there because I guess we're not really sure. Um, we can kind of go off of what we see and, and what we hear and what we've seen for the last four years, but there's not a clear platform there. So, um, you know, I would guess, you know, if, if Donald Trump is reelected, he'll probably consider with, uh, continue with a lot of those economic policies, deregulation, um, and that includes all industries, including education. And so, you know, frontier students will be graduating in the next several years and they'll be going to college. So, um, does it deregulated college environment benefit students or does it benefit like schools? And so that's, that's a real question that you need to ask. Uh, some good talk there about that issue. Um, do you think, what advice could you lay out for students trying to navigate the current political field? Obviously there's a lot of misinformation, a lot of divisiveness. Um, what, what advice would you give to people you know, younger students, whether college or high school, trying to get into the political field, trying to navigate their way through it. What advice would you give to them? Okay. Um, first of all, be nice to each other. We all have different viewpoints, but we're all people. And just because you believe, have one set of beliefs does not mean that you're a bad person. Um, and it doesn't mean that the other person that believes something different is, is a bad person either. Just be nice to each other. We can agree to disagree. Um, and, and that's okay. Uh, as far as navigating disinformation, look at the sources. Look deep at the sources, see where the information is coming from. And that's why I think, it's especially my job as a social studies teacher, I think that's the most important thing I teach, is how to look at information, how to look at sources, looking for bias, uh, looking for you know the credibility of different sources, and, and digging a little deeper because with a little digging, you can always find out how reliable a source is. It doesn't take that much effort. So what would your advice be to people if they're only picking up, because back uh, before in early American history, there was only really one news source. That was basically newspaper and print. Mm -hmm. And it, everybody kind of obtained their own news, but it was the same general source material. Now everybody has different sources that they go to and they almost serve as these echo chambers. What would you say to that specifically? Do you, what are your thoughts on kind of almost the, um, the divide that media has taken, whether it's gone more left or more right, and it's kind of become less about presenting information and more about um, serving each political party? Okay, um, first of all, bias isn't always a negative thing. Okay, so bias isn't always a negative thing. Sometimes it's, bias is simply the lens we see the world through. And so if you look at something on the left, you're gonna see it through a left world or, or left leaning um, glasses. If you look on some, uh, the source from the right, you're gonna see it through uh, right leaning glasses. And that's okay. You're just seeing it through someone else's viewpoint. So my advice would be to diversify your information sources to anybody. Um, don't just go to the Huffington Post for your news and don't just go to Fox News for the news. Look at different sources, find out where they stand politically and read the same article about the same issues and see how they view them and how they're spinning them in different ways. And, you know, with just a little bit of effort, you're going to be able to, to, to see and, and, and find the middle for yourself. Important. Um, and the next question, are you hopeful for the future? Um, you know, obviously with this election cycle comes big change, um, a lot of new faces entering political field, a lot more activism in the youth. Are you hopeful for the future of the country and what direction it's heading? I am hopeful. Um, I think, you know, the, the future is with the young people in this country and, um, you know, just talking to young people and, you know, 
with my children and in with my students and the people I talk to, there's a lot of passion and there's a lot of people that still care. And we see a lot of negative things out there and we hear a lot of negative things. And um, we're hearing from a lot of hateful, really loud sources. But I think the underlying spirit of this country is good and that there are good men and women in this country that want to do the right thing. And uh, yeah, I'm hopeful. I think things are going to, the, the pendulum's going to swing towards a more civil discourse in the future. Um, obviously, Massachusetts, very liberal area, very left wing. Um, but to those areas of the country that are more not so right wing, but even toss up areas, what would you say is probably their biggest concern right now? Maybe it's either the pandemic or the climate. Do you think it's going to be more economically focused or more socially reform focused? Um, I think in like it, typically in more red states, you're going to see more of an, an economic focus um, with the majority of the people there speaking from um, experience growing up in a, in a more red area. Um, that's really probably going to be the focus. However, a lot of these red states are getting hammered hard by COVID. Um, like I grew up in Salt Lake City, Utah, and I just was reading an article the other day that their ICUs are at 104% capacity and they're having to make tough decisions about who gets treatment and who, and who doesn't. And so no matter how concerned you are about the economy, when you have a crisis like that, it's, it's going to steal the headlines. So I think this election is going to be very interesting. Um, obviously, unprecedented circumstances for 2020. Nobody really saw the virus coming until it hit. Um, who do you think most of the blame falls on for the coronavirus handling? Is it the president? Is it his team? Is it the staffers? Was it China? There's been a lot of pointing fingers, and I think most of the American public is generally confused of what to believe and what not to believe. Well, you know, I have a, a, a football team that's losing. And um, you have a lot of good players. I mean, who gets fired? The coach, right? Like if they have a bad season, the coach gets the blame. Um, whether you like the president or you dislike the president, he's a president. Buck stops there. You know, like he's he's got to um, turn it around or, you know, like the, the decision really, or the responsibility rests with the person in charge, in my opinion. Like, and I understand he has some, a lot on his plate. He has some tough decisions to make. Um, but as president of the United States, and I don't care who the president is, if it's a Democrat, it's a Republican, who it might be, um, ultimately they have to make decisions and we have to live with those decisions. So um, does responsibility stop with the president of the United States for something like this, no matter who it is? Absolutely. And we're running out of time here, so I'm just going to try to squeeze in two more questions really quick. Sure. The first being, um, obviously, the president's claim that he might not accept the election results when they come in, saying that it might take weeks or months, and that he's repeatedly claimed that voters, excuse me, mass voter fraud through the mail-in uh, due to the coronavirus, obviously, limitation at the voting poll places. Um, you've seen cuts to the UPS Postal Service, so they're going to struggle to handle this huge surge in mail. Do you worry that the, we might see an early red result and then it might switch to a Biden, which might kind of divide the country even further? And are you even more so worried that the president might not step down from his post if he loses the election? Um, I am confident that cooler heads are going to prevail. Like, I never thought I'd have to worry about this stuff in a million years. Like, I've studied the presidency my entire life. Like, I've I've been involved in history. I've been a teacher for for 12 years, I love American history. I never thought I'd have to say, sit here and have a conversation with somebody. Is the president of the United States gonna accept the results of the election and step down if he's not elected? I never thought I'd have that conversation, but there's been a lot of rhetoric. There's been a lot of fiery rhetoric. And I think at the end of the day, cooler heads are gonna prevail. I hope so. Um, I still have faith in America and the process. And I, and I feel like, you know, the founding fathers, they set up checks and balances for a reason so that if there is an issue like this, um, you know, that the executive power can be checked. Um, I think it's just rhetoric, knock on wood.
finish on a more of a lighthearted question here as we've had still some good good political discourse so far. Um, obviously, a lot of change coming 2020, big election. Um, we're seeing record turnout votes early in just the mail-ins, huge record voting lines. Do you, what, what would you say to people that are discouraged with seeing the current political environment? What would you say to get them civically motivated to go out and vote, even if maybe they don't have a perfect candidate or they're in a deep red area or deep blue area? What would you say to those people? Uh, I would just say, you know, in, that there are people in this world that don't have democracy and don't have this opportunity. And this is an important election. Every ele election is very important, but this election is very important as well. And um, it's pivotal. You have a tr chance to make your voice to be heard. And even if like I'm in Massachusetts, there's not anybody in the country that, that does not believe that Massachusetts will go blue. However, um, I'm still gonna vote because my vote matters and because you know it's it's my civic obligation as a member of this country and, and a citizen of the United States of America to cast that vote vote. And then you know what? If I don't like the outcome, I'll complain about it and I'll have the right to do so. Um it's been a good talk, Mr. Um Eckstein. Eckstein. Yeah. Eckstein. Eckstein. Yep. Eckstein. It's been a pleasure meeting you. I was Zach Lino. All right. Um and this was Frontier Decision 2020.
Uh, hello, I'm the host, Zach Lino. Um, nice to meet you, representing Natalie nice. Blaze. Uh, we're going to get started with the questions here. So first question, obviously with the modern day political environment, 2020 has been a crazy year and everything seems so divided, you know, left, right, Republican, Democrat. Do you think this current very divisive political environment has affected you at all? And if so, how? That's a great question. I appreciate it. Uh, you know, I first got involved in politics the summer after my sophomore year in college. I was an intern for then Congressman Bernie Sanders in his DC office. And I distinctly remember the common practice of identifying a partner from across the aisle when you introduce legislation. There was a desire to find something in common that you could work together to advance. And that was back in the summer of 1996. Uh, and we're here 25 years later, and I'm concerned that this practice has become a thing of the past, that we've become so polarized as a nation with litmus tests to prove how liberal or how conservative you are. And I don't think that's where we should be headed as a nation. I, I think it hinders our progress. All right. Um, and obviously, I talked about briefly your experience in Washington, D.C. Um, how do you think that's changed relatively in the most recent couple of years? Yeah, I um, you know, I worked for Bernie a, a long time ago in D.C. I'm now in Boston in the State House. Um, it was important for me to be on the ground working with the people. Uh, and certainly now that I'm a state elected official, that those relationships have become even more important. And it's been a heck of a first term. <laughs> I was just sworn into office in January of 2019. And my first year was spent building relationships and learning the process. And then COVID hit and, and that learning process started all over again. You know, as I'm sure you're hearing from many people tonight, COVID has changed everything. Um, I'm grateful in the House that House leadership decided early on to make it a priority to continue the business of the House and developed a safe way for us to vote remotely. Uh, we were actually one of the first in the nation to develop a secure method to continue the democratic process during COVID-19. Uh, the legislature also took the historic action of voting to remain in session past the July 31st deadline, since there is still so much work to be done. And I'm proud to have voted in support of that because there is a lot of work still left to be done. Yeah. And, and finally, I think it's important since we're here on election night uh, to talk about the importance of the changes that we made. Uh, the legislature worked hard to protect the rights of voters throughout this crisis. And as a result of those efforts, people could vote by mail, vote early by mail. Uh, vote early in person or vote in person on election day in whatever way they felt safe so that we could make sure that um, voting was accessible and safe. Yeah, and obviously like you talked about um, your intervention on the community level and creating these tight bonds. Um, what do you think Massachusetts as a whole or maybe the greater Boston area's number one pressing issue is in 2020? That's a great question. Uh, COVID obviously is top of mind for everybody, not only in Massachusetts, but the nation. Um, not only because of the healthcare implications, but because of its impact on, on the economy, on jobs, on education, on housing. Um, it's really shown a spotlight on the racial disparities that, that we see across our nation. Um, and we're paying particular attention to gender-based violence that we're seeing uh, or not seeing in this instance, because people are stuck in their homes. And that's certainly something that we are concerned about. Uh, I just mentioned social justice, racial justice. Uh, clearly that is something that has to be a priority, not only for the Massachusetts legislature, but for the federal delegation. And we're so lucky to have such strong leaders there. And then finally, uh, climate change, certainly. And that has been lifted up, thankfully, uh, by young people, not only in, in Massachusetts, but certainly across the nation. All right. Um, we know the next topic at hand. Obviously, 2020 is going to be a big, big year. It's going to be a big election. We've got the president out for stake, a lot of down ballot initiatives. Um, we were curious what your thoughts are on the ranked your choice ballot initiative. 
Sure. So uh, my first race, my the first time I ran for election, it was an eight person race. And something I heard often as we were um, you know, making our case throughout the 19 communities of the first Franklin district was how difficult it was to make a choice because there it was it was a really a strong field and I'm so grateful to have uh, been running alongside such such strong candidates. Uh, but one of the things that constituents, you know, voters talked about during that race was the need for ranked choice voting. And as a result of those conversations, I did co-sponsor the two bills that are currently pending before the legislature having to do with ranked choice voting. And I'll be voting yes on, on two. All right. Um, we were curious what your thoughts are. There's been a lot of talk after the 2016 election about the Electoral College and how, once again, for the two times in this century where the president won the electoral college but didn't win the popular vote um there's been a lot of talk about maybe getting rid of the electoral college amending it um a lot of different talks brought the along the political spectrum we were curious what your thoughts are on the whole electoral college and popular vote situation hmm. that's a great question uh, it, a lot has changed since the Electoral College was first established, and I really do feel as though it's something that we need to take a look at. Uh, the fact that so much attention is paid to so few states, leaving so many people left behind, is really troubling to me. Uh, so I think it's worth a very serious conversation. All right. And um, obviously there have been a lot of claims from the current president that the widespread mail-in vote is going to be substantially fraudulent. Um, concerns over the UPS um, having funding problems, sorry, US Postal Service having funding problems. Um, we were curious what your thoughts are on the claims that voting could be fraudulent this year and if Americans should trust the outcome of the 2020 presidential election. Again, another good question. Uh, this, this election is certainly bringing up a number of, of complicated topics and um, one of them is vote by mail. And I think what we've seen time and time again is that historically uh, voter fraud is, is minuscule. And here in Massachusetts, the secretary of state has come out and said, you know, it is a crime and we will come after you uh, if there is any fraudulent um, activities. And so I do not um, believe the president's claims that vote by mail is plagued by fraud. I think it's one of the most powerful methods that we can use, particularly during a pandemic, to ensure that voters are able to vote safely um, and that they're able to, to return their ballots in a number of different ways. Uh, you can vote in Massachusetts by mail by returning it by the Postal Service. And I do wanna give a shout out to our postal workers who have gone above and beyond to make sure that those ballots are delivered. Um, or you can return it to your town hall via these these, box, these drop boxes, these amazing drop boxes that we've seen pop up again around the entire Commonwealth uh, or to your town clerk. And, and I think that having those options available to you encourage accessibility, encourages participation. And um, that might be what the president is concerned most about right now. All right, uh, we're gonna move on here. We're gonna kind of pivot. So obviously there's been a lot of misinformation spread on both sides of the political spectrum. Um, a lot of social media contributing to this almost new way Americans receive their information these days. It's not through cable or print, it's more through Instagram and Facebook. How do you believe Americans should try to navigate the new social media political field? Well, it's important to get to the facts, which seems to be getting more and more difficult given um, many social media, um, they've, so they've sort of washed their hands of their responsibility to, to provide the facts to the public. Um, and that makes it incumbent upon the citizenry to do that extra legwork. Um, I myself am troubled by, by the use of social media. As an elected official, it's really helpful to, to get the word out to constituents really quickly. At the same time, it troubles me to, to have to buy into the social media system to be able to do that. 
Um, there definitely there needs to be more accountability uh, for those for the social networks to ensure that um, they're held accountable for for the information that they are putting out there. Yeah, and just to play a little bit of devil's advocate here, many on the opposition side claim as soon as you start to crack down on these social media outlets, it's going to be a slippery slope and it could violate, obviously, aspects of the First Amendment, free speech. Where do you think you can draw that line between misinformation and the freedom of expression? Yeah, that's a, it's a tough question. It really is. And the bottom line, I think, is that you have these networks that are out there um, and it's, it's just like, you know, for, for my social media page, I have a social media policy. Um, and if people are, um, uh, bullying other, uh, users, if they're using profanity, if they're spreading misinformation, um, I, I take it upon myself to monitor those pages to make sure that that's not happening. As an elected official, as somebody who's using those pages to get information out there to constituents, I take that responsibility very seriously. I think the social networks need to do the same. All right, very good answer. Um, do you have any advice you could offer to more of the youth, more high school, college level um, individuals who are trying to get into the political scene but are either kind of too scared or struggling to navigate it, especially in the year 2020? Uh, just get involved. Uh, I, I think we're all pretty, very <laughs> accessible. And it, it's really important for me as an elected official to hear from young people, to hear from students, uh, because I value your ideas. I'm interested in your perspectives. And, and I welcome the opportunity uh, to talk with you at any time regarding how I can best support your efforts. And I, and I think that's what's important. I, I take this, this role as being led by the constituents and, uh, and students are an important part of that constituency. And, and you energize me and you lift me up. And, and I just, I would love the opportunity to hear from you more uh, by phone, email. Uh, I'm not good on Insta, but I'm trying to get there. <laughs> um, but yes, uh, reach out in whatever way you feel comfortable, and and we can certainly you know figure out a way to, to have a conversation about what's important to you and how I can best support your efforts. All right. Um, next question is a big one. Obviously, kind of the elephant in the room of 2020 has been the pandemic. Um, COVID-19 has destroyed a lot of American lives. Um, businesses are now shut. Main Street's hurting. Um, there's been a lot of finger pointing going on. Um, some people point blame towards the president. Some people point blame towards China, others to every side in between. Where do you think blame falls the greatest for the mishandling of COVID-19? Wow. Uh, <laughs> I guess I, as a, as a human being, as a person, I have a hard time pointing fingers. I'm much more interested in solutions. Uh, do I wish that things have had been handled differently? Yeah, um, but we're we are where we are, and voters went to their polling stations to make a choice um, to determine what the future looks like, what the future path looks like, and and that's the greatest thing about voting is that um, you have the ability to look at what has happened, whether or not you believe in the leadership that has been provided, particularly during COVID, and who's providing the best path forward. Uh, who, in this case, for me, it's a lot about hope um, and pragmatic solutions. We need to be thinking outside of the box. You know, we, we've, we need to be, you know, if we're looking at the economic recovery for, for a pandemic, particularly for communities in the First Franklin, which are primarily rural, uh, I want to make sure that there is someone who's looking out for, um, for, for everyone, uh, not just pockets of people, and that we're really, that we'll end up better off than we were pre-COVID. And that's a choice that, that voters are left with today. And it's one of the most powerful pieces of democracy. 
All right. Um, this next question, is, we touched on it briefly before, but obviously there's tens of millions of Americans out there who don't vote every election. They feel disenfranchised. They feel like their preferred candidate isn't on that ballot ticket and they don't best represent them. Would you encourage people that maybe don't see 100% with a politician to kind of almost compromise their values to vote for a politician that isn't fully representing them? Well, I think it's I, I think it's important to, uh, you know, it's tough. People are busy, right? Um, you have people who are working nine, not now because we're in the COVID pandemic, but you know, we're, if we're talking about prior elections, you have people who are working nine to five jobs. Some folks were working two to three jobs just to make ends meet. And so their ability to engage in the democratic process was certainly more challenging. And, and that's not the way that it should be. <laughs> uh, we have to be opening up those doors to engage people. We have to be meeting them where they are to ensure that their voices are heard. Um, the, the ballot that you cast helps to ensure that your elected officials represent your beliefs and your priorities. That ballot can also change the way that your legislature looks by making it more reflective of, of the people who reside here in Massachusetts. Um, so I, I firmly believe that we need to be taking edu every action that we can to involve as many people as we can and, and meeting them where they are to ensure that they feel welcome and, and that their value, that their opinions matter and that their, their vote 100% counts. All right, and uh, we're just going to wrap it up here with two quick questions as we're running a little short on time. Do you, would you support an initiative to make voting day a national holiday to try and increase people's civic duty to go out and vote? You know, I've heard, I've heard a lot on both sides of, of this issue, um, and it hasn't been put out there uh, formally as a proposal. And I would rely on the constituents of, of the First Franklin to, to direct me in whether or not to, to support that. Um, I think it could be a really powerful thing, but again, it would be up to the constituents of the First Franklin District to, to let me know where they stand on that issue. All right. And uh, just one quick question here to wrap up, trying to go on more of an introspective base. Okay. <laughs> what do you see yourself doing in the future, not only politically, but for the people of Franklin County? Like the next term, are you talking yes, about? Yes. Okay. <laughs> well, um, we have a number, there are a number of conference committees that are currently meeting with that, that have a number of important uh, pieces that I, pieces of legislation that I've pushed. Um, one of them is the Office of Rural Policy. One of them is the Rural Jobs Act. And uh, so right now I'm fighting to get those through. If those don't get through, you can bet that those will be my top priority in the next legislative session. But generally speaking, it is my because this district is so rural. Uh, it really is driven. You know, my agenda, uh, my priorities on Beacon Hill are really driven to give a voice to rural communities across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. All right, and uh, that's all we have for time. But it's been a pleasure, Representative Blaze. Thank you for speaking to us and engaging a nice little bit of political discourse on election night. Thank you. It was great to meet you, and I really appreciate the questions. All right, welcome back to Frontier Decision 2020. The students this year managed to conduct some online virtual polling data for um, some early exit polls for the presidential election. And here's the breakdown by town so far. Obviously, you see Biden with a very strong lead in all four towns. Conway so far, not almost having any Trump votes in, but we expect that to change as the election evolves. When we move on further, we break it down by age here, we can see that most of the voters in our exit polls are within that middle age range, 36 to 55. Um, and again, the very solid margins here for Biden across the board. Um, next up, we're going to have, do you think this election is more important than the previous one? A very, very strong 94% of voters in the exit polling data said that they believe this election was more important than 2016. So obviously shows that there should be stronger turnout, stronger enthusiasm. All right, moving along here, we have more polling data in for our ballot initiatives in Massachusetts. 
question one. That was the right third pair one. Very strong support for the S's in our exit poll data. Roughly 80% saying that they support the right to repair, um, with around 20% being opposed. The next ballot initiative, that was about the ranked choice voting. It looks much closer to um, around a 70-30 split in our exit polling data. So definitely a little bit more support for kind of not allowing ranked choice voting, but again, still strong margins for the yes category. Ranked choice voting. Uh, yeah, Jim McGovern. So far, looking that they're going to defeat the Republican challenger, Tracy Lovern, with a wide margin or exit point data. That's not confirmed yet, so anything could change in these races. We go to District 2, Richie Neal again. Strong lead over the independent challenger, Frederick Mayock. And as we move into one of our last graphics here, most important issues. Um, obviously, there's a very wide range of what voters are, you know, have on their mind going to those polls today. Um, the economy being a huge one, healthcare a very large one as well, divided nation, racism, and COVID being your top five issues that voters have on their mind from our exit poll data. So that's the latest of our exit poll data. We'll try to keep you posted throughout the night. Thank you. Uh, welcome back. I'm Zach Lino, the host of Frontier Decision 2020. I'm going to be conducting a little interview here with one of the teachers at Frontier Regional, um, Ms. Moore. Hi. So we'll get into the questions here. Um, first question, 2020, it's been a year of years, a lot of going on, um, crazy political environment. What would you say to students um, trying to get into the political field, but they're a little bit scared because of all the divisiveness going on? So as far as students like wanting to study political science, for example, yeah. I still say now more than ever, we need people like you. We need uh, young people. We need uh, fresh ideas, uh, new faces, um, people that can uh, listen. We need to listen to each other. So even though things are divisive, I think we have a great opportunity right now because things are so divisive. So definitely, I say go for it. Go for it. Very, it's interesting, really interesting stuff. All right. Obviously, election day, a lot that's going to be happening. I think uh -huh. either way that it comes out, people are going to be unhappy with the results. Um, what do you say, though, with the people that are concerned that the current president might not accept the results if they come out that he loses? Well, I have to say I've never seen anything like this in my lifetime, and I think it's unfortunate that um, what we've grown accustomed to throughout our 200-plus year history that if – if somebody loses, we're, we're used to a peaceful transfer of power, and um, I really hope that people don't get violent. I hope the president doesn't. Um, I hope he doesn't follow through with that threat of, you know, trying to sue states and that kind of thing. And from what I've seen and what I've read about the amount of people voting, so many people have voted already. Um, it, it's just unprecedented. So I do think a lot of people want to make sure that whatever the outcome, at least their vote has been cast. And there's not a lot of people staying at home and just saying, throwing up their hands and saying, oh, I don't care about this. Um, obviously, 2020 has been a big year. A lot of different events happening with past sad passing of RBG. Um, coronavirus, the economy, there's been a lot of big topics. What do you think is going to be the number one issue driving people to the polls this election night? Um, our democracy. We're in a really fragile place right now. It's not like we haven't been here before. Uh, for those of you that remember U.S. history, and th like 1968, one of the more recent periods of time, we re really, really divided. But I do think that um, there's a silver lining to all of this. It's clear that we need some kind of change. And um, in order for that to happen, some, a lot of time people just have to get out there. They have to get out in the streets and peacefully, peacefully make their voices heard and protest. Um, so I think um, I think we're going to see some changes happening, um, but change is slow. Um, but I think of um, folks, John Lewis, who also passed away this past July, a civil rights icon who I've met many times. Um, you know, he was one who never shrunk or, or uh, you know, stayed at home. He just made sure that he was out there all the time fighting for everybody's rights. And I think that's what we need to do now is to make sure everybody gets involved but does it in a peaceful way yeah obviously there's been the whole social movement of black lives matter after the tragic passing of george floyd and 
critics on the other side have claimed that most of it has actually been rioting and looting, while the other side claims it's mostly peaceful. Where do you fall on the spectrum of viewing it? Do you think it's mostly violent, or do you think it's mostly peaceful? And if so, what message do you think they're trying to send either way? I think it's been mostly peaceful, and I've followed this. I've also been part of like large um, mass protests in Washington, D.C. I've never... Um, I've never felt particularly afraid. Um, and I did go to a couple of smaller events th this past summer. Uh, I think what's happening now because of social media and because of um, manipulating media, it's easy to say um, that there's been more violence when in fact there really hasn't been. Um, it's, it's very complicated, but at least in my experience, um, I've seen more peaceful protests than anything else. And again, times when um, 1960s, similar thing, like, okay, so there's a lot of protesting. And sometimes what happens is to instill fear. People are afraid when they, when they see these violent images on TV, which is understandable. Um, but if that's all they see, um, it's, that's not the right message to be sending. The, the message is we all have the right to protest as long as it's peaceful. So if people are like looting, it's like, no, absolutely not. I don't care what the reason is. But I would say from what I've read and seen, it's mostly peaceful. All right. We're going to squeeze out two more quick questions here. First sure. being, obviously, in the two elections in the 21st century have ended up where the person who won the popular vote didn't win the election. What's happened with George Bush and Donald Trump? Um, what do you think about the Electoral College? Should it be amended, removed, changed at all? For me personally, I think we need to change it somehow. Um, but I think more broadly, the country, we have to deal with this. Um, but, you know, when the Electoral College, and it's not even part of the Constitution, so it is something we could actually change. But from the very beginning, from the outset, um, the Electoral College was put in place basically to give the, um, the smaller states, the minority states, an equal, if not larger voice is what has ended up happening. Uh, a lot of it had to do with slavery, and we're living with that legacy today. Um, we now have more than 330 million people in this country. <laughs> Back then, it was about 4 million. So it's clear that people want a change. They're just not sure what kind of change. Um, and I think we need to deal with it as a country. Um, because when this happened in 2020, uh, and actually in the year 2000, there was a lot, a lot of, oh, yeah, how, how could this happen? How could this happen? And then we just kind of, we forgot about it. We didn't worry about it so much Then it happened again in 2016. So I think now there's more of a push to do something different with it, which we could do if we wanted to. It has to be political will, enough will. All right. And a final question here and on more of a lighthearted note. Are you hopeful for the future? And if so, what do you think the, con the direction of the country is going to move in, whether it be left wing or right wing? And you know why I'm wicked hopeful? And this is going to sound corny, but I say this all the time. It's because of you. You specifically and the younger generation. I mean, me. it's not like you can't be older and be hopeful and make a difference. But I'm seeing a lot more um, activity and awareness with this younger generation. And that makes me really hopeful. And whatever, whatever things you believe, whether you're conservative, liberal, progressive, whatever. Uh, the fact that you're more involved makes me really, really hopeful. All right, and that's all we time we have for today. But we thank Miss Moore for her time. Thank, thank you, you for your thoughtful political discourse, and hopefully, whoever wins this election, whether it be Joe Biden or Donald Trump, the country unites and start the healing process after the election. We have to. All right. Thanks, Zach. Yep. Thank you. All right, welcome back. Um, Frontier Decision 2020. We have some crucial poll numbers out of the Frontier election. We've been doing it for the past couple of years now, and we got some numbers here. I got a couple co hosts I'll be helping to break it down. I'm Abigail. I'm Olivia. And I'm obviously the host, Zach Lino. So we're getting the numbers here. It looks like Joe Biden managed to garner 72.9% of the total votes, a very large lead, um, something we've seen at least in 2016 when the school did the election before with Hillary Clinton won by a large margin before, um, totaling over 300 votes. So it was definitely a large voter turnout. Um, 
think people were not so much excited to vote this year, but they felt motivated to. Uh, what are your thoughts? Um, I think something that's also important to recognize in this is that this was a completely voluntary survey. Um, so there might be some bias in that. But for the most part, I think that there was a pretty good turnout. So I think that this will pretty well act pretty accurately represent our school's political beliefs. Uh, Olivia, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I agree with Abby, definitely. And especially, um, I don't know if it makes a difference, but that the uh, votes were confidential, which also makes a difference. But I was interested to see that 89 voted for Trump. And then we also had the... uh, Stephen Gripko, the Kanye, and all these other candidates who are added to it. Yeah, and obviously, with, oh, oh, you go. I think it's interesting. Um, personally, I am surprised about how many people voted that uh, did not vote for Biden or Trump, because at least in from what I've heard in our school hallways, there really isn't much talk about any other candidates. So I think it's interesting to see that um, people decided to not go for either of them. All right, obviously we have so many numbers here tonight, so we're going to keep it moving on to the next one here. All right, uh, this was the representative breakdown for District 1 and 2. Our numbers got a little bit jumbled in the machine, so came out with a little bit of a mixed result, but it looks like, at least for District 2, Jim McGovern won handedly with over 60% of the results. Yep, and I think that this is a pretty good proportion um, in comparison to the last slide that we showed. Uh, it's about the same um, percentage between Republicans and Democrats as there is this time as well. In both districts, too, which is interesting. Yeah. Yeah. All right, on the next one here. All right, so this graph, um, it may look a little confusing to some viewers at home, but basically this is the party breakdown. So if you see on your left hand, you're going to be seeing your Democrats. If you hover over there, you're going to see that of the people identified as Democrat, over 99% voted Joe Biden or the Democratic candidate. Over the Republican side, you had close to 10%, one in 10 Republicans actually choosing Biden for the election. So interesting there. There's a little bit more difference among the Republican side and there's the Democrat side. Yeah, it's definitely interesting to see how um, some of those who uh, identify as Republicans jumped over to the Biden ship. Do you think that, Abby? Or? Um, I think it's also interesting to see that um, over the years has really been a polarization between our political parties of, you know, if this was probably taken 50 years ago, there would be a lot more of a mix. As of now, it's, you know, with the exception of one in 10, you know, Republicans, which is still a fairly small percentage, people usually stick to the party that they have to their candidate. All right, we on to some of the last numbers here. So I believe the next graph displays what people's most important issue they thought was facing the country. Obviously, you see the environment being the number one, but no one topic got a majority of the vote. It was very much a split. Um, obviously, healthcare was a number large issue with over 28%. Curious to hear you guys' thoughts as to why the votes turned out the way they did for the issues. I found this one interesting because I feel as though for the not sure category, it could have been, they could have either responded as not sure because there were many different um, major Um, issues that they felt were very important or they just generally weren't sure of which how they would rank them. Um, I think it's also interesting that the biggest concern on here, the environmental with 34.2 percent, is we do live in a very rural area. So naturally, I think we tend to care a lot more about the environment and a lot of us are really passionate about that as of it'd be interesting to see the statistic between us and a more um, urbanized uh, town. All right. All right. And obviously we had a couple of ballot questions uh, this year round. Um, first one, right to repair. Interested to hear your thoughts, Abby. Um. I think this one's interesting because this hasn't really been talked a lot about. So before making this decision, students and faculty had to do um, more research on their end. 
but I'm not entirely surprised by the uh, outcome to this based on the Democratic and Republican proportions that we have around here. And Olivia? I agree with Abby, and I think that even though they gave an example of what this is on the um, poll questions, I think if people did a little more research, then this um, outcome might have differed. All right, moving right along here. We got more to cover. All right, uh, next question was rank choice voting. So essentially trying to change the voting style in Massachusetts to where you can rank your candidates by how much you like them compared to just voting for your fit most favorite choice. Um, let's just hear your thoughts, Olivia. I think this is interesting because there's clearly like the same percentages as the last one. But again, I feel like this one, it's not talked about a lot, especially like any of the mass questions and that it really differs because it may have differed among age, generation, everything. And so people might've heard about their parents talking about this, but if they had more of an idea of how it worked, then they might have had a different opinion. And over to Abby. Um, yeah, it's cool because this one seems to be a little bit more divided than the other questions have been. So it kind of gives a more diverse insight to what people are believing around here. All right, moving right along. The next graphic is going to display the popular vote of whether we should abolish electoral college or not. Obviously, again, it looks like about two to about two thirds split um, for yes to abolish electoral college. One third saying no. Interested to hear your thoughts, Abby. This isn't entirely surprising as um, most people around here are Democratic and um, uh, our current President Trump was voted in based on the Electoral College, despite him losing the popular vote, which persuaded a lot of people into believing that the Electoral College should be abolished. And this percentage pretty well reflects the Republican-Democrat um, divide between around here. Yeah, just to briefly touch on Olivia, any thoughts? I know that the electoral electoral college was originally um, created for because not many people are educated about politics. But I know that now, since we have social media, people are more educated, and so therefore, people believe why do we need the electoral college? So I'm not very surprised by this turnout. All right, moving right along. Um, essentially, this is talking about should the U.S. adopt the Green New Deal in order to battle climate change, and obviously, as sweeping support, 82 percent. That's larger than the margin we saw for the votes to Biden. So clearly it's winning over at least some of the third party or Republican support. Interested to hear your thoughts, Olivia. Uh, again, about this is that um, the Green New Deal, I feel like if people knew more about it and had more that it's not really the details aren't very talked about um, common and or commonly. And so um, I'm not very surprised by the turnout. I think this is also interesting to look at because going back to what we were talking about, about how we live in a rural area, so a lot more people are passionate about the environment. I think that people are just really willing to get any kind of bill through that will attack climate change. All right, moving right along here. We have the next one, which is, should the U.S. adopt universal health care system? Obviously, a platform more supported by the left wing or the Democratic Party, less so by the Republicans, one which favored more of a status quo or less government intervention. Interested to hear your thoughts, Olivia. Uh, I know that the universal health care system, as it says, similar to Canada, has been adopted by a lot of different countries and that it has been shown to be very successful and very helpful. And so I'm not very surprised by this turnout especially since healthcare has been talked about as a huge political issue. And Abby? Yeah, um, I think that even a year ago, this percentage would have been vastly different. As of now, we are living in a pandemic, and this issue is a lot more personal to a lot more people, that I think it has swayed a lot more than just the Democrats to it. Yeah, obviously a huge issue now with the pandemic. We're going to be moving on to the next graphic here. This one was very close. Should the U.S. place some limitations on free speech? Overall, the no's won out against the yeses, but it was a very close split. Love to hear your thoughts, Abby. So for this, I think that it doesn't really come down to whether you are a Democrat or Republican because a lot of the issues overlap between the two. Um, I think it really comes down to your morals. Um, and I think that for a lot of people, they don't have 
a very strong opinion. It's much more of they can see either way, but they might feel a little bit strongly more on the yes or no scale. All right, Olivia, any thoughts? Yeah, I agree a lot with Abby and that I'm just surprised at how close it is to a 50-50 turnout. Obviously, very close issue that one was. Moving swiftly along here, the next graphic. Um, this one obviously was disgusting. Should voting day be a national holiday? Seemed like almost unanimous with the yeses. A lot of people support the idea. Um, hasn't been talked about too much on the national level, but would love to hear your thoughts, Olivia. I am not very surprised by this turnout because I know that um, for younger generations being in school and stuff, it would mean that we wouldn't have school. So I'm sure that they had a big um uh, impact on the outcome for the students. And Abby? I think it's also interesting to compare this statistic to the other ones that were had the no around 17% of it is easy to assume that it's the same people that chose yes for these and no for the others. Yeah, consistency throughout the polls here. Moving on to one of the last graphics we're going to have. It is is your candidate you chose the same as your parent or guardian? So obviously this was talking about whether the students, what candidate they voted for, was going to be the same as what their parents are voting for in the election. It's interesting to see the breakdown here. It's kind of split them on the three-way. Um, interested to hear what your thoughts are, Abby. I think that a lot of times as kids, we aren't sure if we share our parents' political beliefs, especially on the younger side, um, such as like middle school as a freshman, because they might not have open conversations with their parents about politics. So they may simply not sure know where their family lands or maybe their family just doesn't really converse in that way. Um, but I think it's also not surprising that close to 50% say yes because frequently children are very influenced by the parentals. And Olivia, anything to add? Uh, I definitely think that um, for the older students, they're more active on social media or reading or watching the news more so they have become more educated with their thoughts. And I definitely agree with Abby's opinion about the how parents may have definitely had a big or how parents and their kids views are definitely similar. Yeah. All right. Let me on the next one here. Uh, do you feel this election was presented in a more negative light than the previous elections? Obviously, a lot of people agree. It seems, again, like what Abby referenced earlier with that around 14 to 16, 17 percent, they're always kind of on the opposition side of it. But definitely an interesting breakdown here. We'd love to hear your thoughts, Olivia. Um, this election has gotten so much coverage on it, and there has been so many controver controversial topics that have been brought up between the two candidates. And it's just clear watching presidential debates and everything that I'm really not surprised about this turnout. Yeah. Uh, anything to add, Abby? Uh, I think it's also that um, since this was done on a school that obviously has teenagers in it, we're all very active on social media. So it's kind of hard not to see some of the negative light that's been put on this election. Yeah. Next up here, as we continue along our election night coverage, do you think TV media coverage and social media coverage will affect the way you vote? Very again, it's one of those close toss ups when we saw that earlier. Um, interested to hear your thoughts, Olivia. I definitely am very surprised by this turnout, how it's so close to 50 50 again, because knowing how much people are on social media, especially the younger generations, that you think that more people would think that that would be effective. But at the same time, I'm not very surprised because people stick with their views most of the time, no matter what social media says. Yeah, and Abby. Uh, this also plays into whether you felt as if your parents um, had leverage over what you believed in. Uh, it was kind of that same percentage of, you know, 46% said that they have the same beliefs as their parents and 40, about 46% here say that um, the media won't have influence and it's probably because they are getting influence from other sources other than social media. Yeah, very good point. 2020, a big year, big election. Um, I believe that's all for our polling data for tonight, but thank you for my co-host for showing up and giving some amazing political discourse and thoughts on the election results for the frontier election at least.
Welcome, Frontier Decision 2020. We have a wonderful moment here to talk to the principal of Frontier, um, Mr. Lenitas. So welcome. We thank him for his time. Hi, thank you for having me. All right. We're getting to some questions here, and obviously we'd love to hear an administrative perspective on 2020. It's definitely been a different kind of year um, with the pandemic and a lot of changes in the school and how it works. Obviously, 2020, it's had its downs, it's had its ups. We're interested to hear what is the faculty perspective with being able to help reopen Frontier so quickly and effectively during the pandemic? It was really heartening um, when we when we talked about doing it, uh, you know, when, over the summer, which seems like a lifetime ago, uh, we put together all of these different committees. Um, we had people from throughout the district. We had administrators, teachers, we had office staff. We had all these people working in tandem and it was really wonderful. Uh, people worked they work their butts off to really create systems that were gonna get students back into the building, that were gonna get faculty back in the building. We had volunteers, you know, we had people from the community, you know, reaching out to me saying, how can we help, you know, can I help? Like we had people, you know, saying, I can come and help and sub, um, you know, we can do donations if you need it. So it was really wonderful because during such an uncertain time when we, there's a lot of anxiety, I think, for a lot of people, but it was just wonderful to, to, to see us come together as a community and, and to really address this. And I think that we've been very uh, successful in getting this off the ground. Um, it's, you know, uh, it's it's obviously we, we all wish that it was just like it was last year. But, you know, it's like but I really think that um, working together, I think we've done a wonderful job. And I'm really uh, we have the teachers here are just they're they're phenomenal. They're just, they'll do everything they can for, for the students. So it's just, it's a great thing. We're very lucky, I think. All right. Um, obviously, it's an election year, 2020. Do you have anything you'd like to say to the students after the election results come out, either one side or the other? What would you say to try to help unify and calm the student body after the election? I would say that despite what people might think are these sort of vast political differences that people have, when you really get down to it, people, people we, we all have so much in common with each other. We all want the same things for ourselves, for our families, uh, you know? And so uh, I would try to, I would, I would ask that, that students be respectful of each other uh, and, to be, and to be kind and caring towards each other. I think that that's really important. Um, you know, uh, assume good intent, uh, you know, and, and try to come from a good place. I, 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 it doesn't work like that. So yeah. this is something that we're going to we're going to continue working on. All right. It's good to hear. Um, obviously, Frontier strives for being a very inclusive environment and welcoming of all. What do you think is Frontier's biggest um, point to that um, argument that they are very welcoming and inclusive to the community at hand? So I think that. I think that the the fact the, the fact that the students when we started doing the anti-racism work we had so many students that were really on board with it um you know we sh we had the movie um last week and then we had the 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 following day we had we had some stuff happening in the classes and the responses from the kids were really overwhelmingly positive uh and that's once again that's very heartening that's that's really nice to see so 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 there's a willingness to to want to be inclusive on on behalf of the majority of the students and i think that that's really important we're interested to hear what your thoughts are on the whole idea of creating a formal frontier red hawk logo uh actually i'm i'm really happy about that uh i think it's something that that's it's nice to actually have the the students work with us on something like that um I know that part of the I know part of the issue had been some of the um, the sort of uh, the, the the sort of the the remaining pieces of the logo that had been from the old Redskins logo, and I know that that was something that they wanted to try that they wanted to uh, to do away with. So I think the idea of doing this as a school community and having student artists um, be a part of it, I think, is really wonderful. Um, plus, it'll also because as of right now, I, I'm sure as you well know, it's like we have four or five different logos when you go out there. So so it would actually be really nice. I like the idea of having one, obviously one logo, but I also, I really like the idea of having one, of having a student artist be a part of it as well, which I think is really important. Yeah, really nice to see that uh, administrators are reaching out to the student body and getting some nice cooperation there. It's really nice to see. I saw um, some of the art today and it was it was fantastic. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Some good work being done by the students and the faculty. Um, obviously it's an election year, 2020. 
Do you have anything you'd like to say to the students after the election results come out, either one side or the other? What would you say to try to help unify and calm the student body after the election? I would say that despite what people might think are these sort of vast political differences that people have, when you really get down to it, people, people we, we all have so much in common with each other. We all want the same things for ourselves, for our families, uh, you know, and so, I would try to. I would. I would ask that that students be respectful of each other uh, and to be and to be kind and caring towards each other. I think that that's really important. Um, you know, uh, assume good intent. Uh, you know, and, and try to come from a good place. I, I, that's that's what I think is really important. Um, you know, uh, that's that's what I would say. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. We thank you for your time for joining Frontier Decision Twenty Twenty. Thank you, uh, Mr. Lenitas. I was your host, Zach Lino. This is Frontier Decision 2020. <clears throat> All right, welcome back to Frontier Decision 2020. The students this year managed to conduct some online virtual polling data for um, some early exit polls for the presidential election. And here's the breakdown by town so far. Obviously, you see Biden with a very strong lead in all four towns. Conway so far, not almost having any Trump's votes in, but we expect that to change as the election evolves. When we move on further, we break it down by age here. We can see that most of the voters in our exit polls are within that middle age range, 36 to 55. Um, and again, very solid margins here for Biden across the board. Um, next up, we're going to have, do you think this election is more important than the previous one? A very, very strong 94% of voters in the exit polling data said that they believe this election was more important than 2016. So obviously shows that there's going to be stronger turnout, stronger enthusiasm. All right, moving along here, we have more polling data in for our ballot initiatives in Massachusetts. Question one, that was the right to repair one. Very strong support for the S's in our exit poll data. Roughly 80% saying that they support the right to repair, um, with around 20% being opposed. The next ballot initiative, that was about the ranked choice voting. It looks much closer to um, around a 70-30 split in our exit polling data. So definitely a little bit more support for kind of not allowing ranked choice voting, but again, still strong margins for the yes category. Ranked choice voting. Uh, yeah, Jim McGovern, so far looking that they're gonna defeat the Republican challenger, Tracy Lovern, with a wide margin or exit point data. That's not confirmed yet. So anything could change in these races. We were district two, Richie Neal again, strong lead over the independent challenger, Frederick Mayock. And as we move into one of our last graphics here, most important issues. Um, obviously, there's a very wide range of what voters are, you know, have on their mind going into those polls today. Um, the economy being a huge one, healthcare, a very large one as well. Divided nation, racism, COVID being your top five issues that voters have on their mind from our exit poll data. All right, folks. And Due to the fact that this is pre-recorded, we aren't going to have all the data in, so these are just kind of some of the early exit poll results that we're showing you. None of this is confirmed or set in stone. We expect this to shift as the night moves on, but these are the polls that we're bringing you. All right, welcome to Frontier Decision 2020 of our election night coverage. We're meeted today by Mr. McDaniels. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having me. Happy yeah. to be here. All right, we're going to start with a couple of questions here. Obviously, 2020 has been a year of years. A lot of different national events have happened with the Black Lives Matter movement, passing with important political figures such as John Lewis, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and the coronavirus epidemic. So we're going to start here tonight with an important question, and that is the coronavirus handling. Obviously, there's been a lot of different fingers pointing and a lot of blaming for different sides, whether it was China's fault or Trump's mm -hmm. handling of the virus. We're curious to hear, where do you think the blame falls on the handling of the COVID-19 situation? Well, I think we always knew at some point that a virus such as this would come along. Um, and, and you can't really blame one person for or a country for creating a virus. It can come out of anywhere. It's just a natural, you know, it's a natural uh, biological thing that can happen. We just don't happen to have any uh, medicine for it at the moment or a cure for it. So... I think the reason that it is um, 
that it has gotten as bad as it is, is, is the presidential leadership. I mean, I think um, I, this would be difficult for any president, any administration, um, but personal, these are just my personal feelings, um, not, you know, not any position of the town of Deerfield, but I, I feel personally that, um, that this administration could have done so much more earlier on. Um, I think he blames, you know, he takes um, refuge in the fact that he stopped the China travel, um, which I think was an important step. And I think early on, nobody really knew. I think that was an easy choice for him to make early on. Um, it, it kind of flowed really with his view on immigration anyway. So that's why I think a lot of people had felt that it was xenophobic to do it to begin with, because re really nobody knew what the extent of the virus was at the time. But I think since that time frame, all the uh, all the negative impact really lands squarely with his administration and the way he's downplayed. Um, and and you've heard from from the different interviews that have come out in different books, he downplayed the seriousness of it when he knew it, and he unfortunately he created it um, into a political issue. So if, if you know, you, you're, if you're with me, you don't wear a mask. If you're not with me, then you wear a mask and, and you're afraid. And it's, um, I just think what he has done to create divisiveness in this country, especially on this one issue where it really should not be a political issue, it should be a, a public health issue. Um, so I, I lay a lot of the brain. I can't blame Trump for everything that had to do with this because it, there's so much that um, no one can control, but he's taken every opposite step I believe you should have taken. Yeah, all right. Um, moving forward, how do you think the coronavirus has impacted more local communities such as Deerfield? It's been devastating for, for us. Um, I, you know, it really, it, again, it hasn't had to be I don't think it had to have gone on this long and got this um, difficult because we would have um, we could have controlled it. Deerfield has done a very good job, and I think Western Mass on a whole, Massachusetts on a whole, has done a very good job of of wearing the mask and listening to public health officials. We have great people such as um, you know Lisa White and Carolyn Ness, our, our select. Uh, woman chair, and she she has always been involved with public health and really focused on the well-being of, of residents. So I think those early actions, we were one of the first towns in the state to declare a state of emergency, to shut down our town hall, um, you know, had early conversations with the superintendent about the schools and what we would do there. Um, so I think we jumped on it early. Um, it's just been, it's just been devastating because of the economic impact that, that, um, it's affected the town, um, different restaurants and different businesses, but it's also affected municipal government. And it, it has changed immensely how hard our employees are working now and how much more that they're spending their time on coronavirus response and how to hold a meeting, how to make sure a meeting is safe for the public, how to make sure people are safe when they participate. Um, that's taken up literally 80% of the oxygen. So all of the other initiatives that you would normally be doing during a town a year, fiscal year, have had to take a step back. And so it's really had a negative impact on the productivity of a town. And, you know, we, we've muscled through it and we've done a great job and I couldn't be more prouder of all the employees here, but um, it's, it's, it's very stressful for everybody. All right, moving on along here. What do you think is one of the biggest problems with the current state of America's economy? Obviously, it took a big hit after COVID. What do you think is the pathway to recovery for the economy? I think the pathway to recovery, I hope um, the next administration, if they so choose, you know, if they if they are so lucky to win, um, would take a more proactive role as far as public health and would um, unfortunately have to do the hard things of locking down again for a short time. Um, but if everybody would just wear a mask and lock down for, you know, 14 days, three weeks, um, you could really make a huge impact on, you know, you, it, 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 
it's pretty it's pretty scientific. It has a life cycle. So it's not like we don't know how to how to stop it or how to slow down the transfer. So um, the transmission rate. So I think if we took a hard step, did that, we could really make a huge indent in a short amount of time on the the um, the slope of in, you know of increase of illness and and infection. And I think you know you can't fix the economy until you until you fix the the virus. So if we, the sooner we can get to really clamping down and everybody treating it as a um, as a patriotic duty for, you know, people's jobs and their livelihood. We just, we, again, bite the bullet early. We take that hard stance. Um, if everybody did that and wear the mask and social distance, washed your hands, we could, we could be in a lot better case than we are right now. So um, we, well, the only way we can do that is to lessen the divisiveness between the two parties right now and the two camps really I, i'd call it um and i i think just looking at the way joe biden has um has campaigned that his message has always been that he'll be uh, a president for all of america even if you didn't vote for him he still is going to care about your health and care about your needs and i think um bringing the country together is really the only way that we're going to fix that and it's very hard with the media the way it is today yeah, uh, that you actually beautifully led into our next question here, which is the media coverage of the election. Obviously, mm -hmm. a lot of people have viewed it, at least in our exit poll data so far, as highly negative. Um, mm -hmm. And they view it now, the election, as being more important than the last election four years ago. Do you agree with that statement, that the media yeah. coverage is more divisive and aggressive than before? Well, I think, um, I think the media... So it depends on what spectrum you're on or what what echo chamber you're living in and watching the, the election, because I think um, the media has been vilified so much by the current administration that I think there's some animosity, even though they're trying hard to be um, unbiased in their coverage. When you're called the enemy of the people for four years or five years straight, I think you can tend to take on a a, you know, more of a vitriolic, you know, um, tone in how you cover a certain administration. I think Joe Biden has done a pretty good job of, you know, walking that fine line of of not being uh, disrespectful and hurtful, um, but has really called out the failings that he, that he has had um, as an administration and all the things that have gone on. I just think of all the things that have happened in the last four years. It's a, it's a mountain of stuff. Um, we're, we're so numb to it now, but I do think it really, um, it depends on your, your spectrum. So where, where you're sitting, what you're watching. Um, if you feel, if you feel it's negative, uh, I think, I think the way that Trump has governed has been negative. So, so if you're covering that you're around that. And I think that's really what's worn out a lot of people from, you know, giving this man a shot four years ago to where they stand today, all the negativity that has uh, he fosters because he think, you know, that, that sells eyeballs, it sells media, you know, and media is a money-making item. So that's, you know, I think, I think you could see it as negative. All right. Moving on to the next question here. Do you think that this 2020 election will impact the local communities in an adverse way or a positive way? Well, it depends on uh, again how it turns out. If it, if um, I think if Biden comes in, it would be a positive. I think that um, you know th this current administration has not put through any infrastructure fund funding at all. Um, there's so much that he had promised four years ago that would be happening, and um, towns such as Deerfield have struggled because we haven't had a farm bill. We haven't had, you know, for our farmers um, and, and for just a lot of the different grant programs that would come through USDA. Um, we have a grant for our repairing our sewer system through the USDA, but they don't know where money is going to come from. Um, and I just think if we had a Biden administration, I think some of those fundamental um, government processes that just need to happen would happen. And especially if we win the Senate. Um, the Senate is is just as important as the government, the um, as the presidency. So, 
Um, I think it would have a good um, impact on Deerfield just because we have a lot of farmers and we have a lot of programs that we want to get going. Um, but we need some stability and some um, forecast and, you know, where we're going for a budget. All right. Curious to ask you about a couple of ballot initiatives that Massachusetts oh, had sure. seen. Um, obviously. Yeah. Interested to hear your thoughts on right to repair. We'll start there. Yeah. So um, I, I wish I was a little more knowledgeable about this. I've waffled a little bit on it. Um, I think the question, I believe, is, you know, right to repair. And I, I believe it's a little bit of a misnomer the way that's done. It really has to do with. Um, data and personal data and i think if if i understand this right correct me if i'm wrong but I, if you would allow this data to be public to anybody um i think a lot of that of the yes campaign on this has been you know the the not the local repair shop but the auto zones and the riley auto parts and you know there's a lot of big money behind um freeing up all that data and I think that you can still get your car repaired anywhere you want, but I think what they're going to have access to, and my biggest fear and probably why I would vote no on it is because I think it's too dangerous to have a complete open um, data stream on, on these new cars because, you know, hacking happens everywhere. And with the cars being so much more technologically advanced, I think having your, you know, your brakes and your, you know, all of that stuff that run your car as an open source um, is very dangerous. I think that you do need some sort of privacy when it comes to that. And, and if I choose as an owner, since I purchased the product, if I choose as an owner to open that up, I think there should be a pathway there. I just think this, this question um, is too open. Uh, like your data would be wide open for anybody across the web to find out where you've been. You have issues with domestic violence, you know, people being, you know, find out where you're driving, where you've been. I just think it's a little too open and you still need some sort of privacy. All right. Uh, another important ballot initiative, um, ranked choice voting. Here, yeah. curious to your thoughts. Yeah. So I think, uh, so I, I am in favor of ranked choice voting. I think, um, Again, I'm not uh, 100% knowledgeable on the subject as I would like to be, but I, from what I understand, if you go to vote, um, you would vote for, oh, say, if there was three people running, it'd be a one, two, three, your choices in that way. So if the first person doesn't win, um, your vote would then go to the second person. Um, and I, I just think that that kind of makes more sense. And, and I believe it's if you haven't gotten over 50%. Um, yeah, I, I could yeah. be wrong about That's that, correct. right? They, yeah, they so, keep eliminating the last person with uh, total votes until the candidate gets above 50%. Right, right. So I think it seems like it's the fairest way to, you know, to do that if you if you have a, a runoff and it might foster more diverse views in, you know, for running. So instead of just a two party thing, you could have a, a third vision there, an independent or, a, you know, Green Party or something running and, um, so the the person that you know you'd want to get there might wind up um, somebody at least similar. So it was it isn't just a a one or the other. It gives you another another choice there. So um, yeah, I think I, I think I'd vote in favor of that. All right. Obviously, there's been a lot of talk about um, environmental justice and environmental action. Mm -hmm. Do you support um, candidates trying to pledge towards the Green New Deal or such environmental policies? Trying to kind of almost reimagine how our current energy system works? I do. I think, um, you know, I'd have to study each policy as it came through. Um, and I haven't done a deep dive on the, you know, on the Green New Deal, but I, I do think that we need to change holistically how we manage our energy in this country and, um, and our money. You know, we, 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 um, we subsidize fossil fuel you know, um, and then, you know, I think people who, who want to see that transfer to green energy, uh, whether it be wind or solar, um, you know, the opposition's like, oh, well, you're, you know, you're, you're just transferring wealth. Well, we've transferred wealth our, our whole existence. Uh, you know, th that's the game of politics is the big money comes in and writes the bills. So I think, um, I do think it's important. Our, our 
you know, our, our, our um, world is not going to survive. Your generation is not going to survive. With You'll be dealing with a lot worse um, impacts to climate. Um, we, we just really can't get our head around it. I think it's such a large... Um, to such a large topic, it's really hard for anybody, any one person to kind of really understand the true impacts. And, and once they start feeling those impacts, it is too late. You can't, you can't turn that ship around. So I'm really excited to see the work that Frontier students have done. And um, we have started to take on as, as a municipality, um, green infrastructure, one of the first first towns in the state to do a green infrastructure policy. So any any new work that we do, we have, um, you know, a catch basins with with uh, with tree, you know, tree um, basins to kind of collect the water off the street downtown. So any kind of work that we're starting to do in town, uh, we're looking at it with um, resiliency in mind. When we redo our sewer system, we're looking at raising the walls of the of the clarifiers to make sure that you know when we have flooding that we're still protected um we've been one of the first state we are the first town in the state to sign on to the municipal vulnerable uh, preparedness act um, these are grants put out by the state that will um, give you funding for engineering and infrastructure projects so we're changing over our culverts the big culvert right across from frontier on captain lathrop drive is going to be um is going to be redone and then uh we've done one up by uh, up by the uh deerfield academy that had has failed we have we have over we have hundreds of culverts in the town and some are built with old pipes some are built stone they're just um they can't handle the amount of water that comes at once right now so we're trying to just do little things that we can do to make our town more resilient um so we're not spending you know hundreds of millions of dollars to fix things um we're trying to fix them and anticipate large flows of water. And um, we redesigned the parking lot of Frontier. Um, we hope to get funding for that, but to manage the water off of that large, you know, piece of asphalt that we would do asphalt that could take the water and put it into the into the ground itself instead of running running off into Bloody Brook. So there's all little things that people can do. We're putting solar on on our um, on our um, landfill. So to use that brown field as, as something that could produce energy for the town, um, we've approved a lot of solar function, you know, solar fields in town. So uh, we're we're very proactive, I think, in town when it comes to this. But everybody needs to come together and make a bigger bigger push for it. All right. Well, Obviously, add, there's been one, another. Let me add one thing to that, if I could. So um, <clears throat> if you look at Alaska and how. Uh, how each person, if you're a resident of Alaska, you get a check in the mail for the oil that's produced. I'm not sure why we don't do that with tech or 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 other things. So so there's a lot of a lot of industry that produces stuff, you know. That again, the United States government funded the internet. Um, so why don't why doesn't all, why don't all people get the benefit of that? Why is it? only the money going to Google's and Apple's and, you know, all the, all the high end tech companies there, you know, Apple's the first company to be over a billion dollars of, um, of net worth. So I think, um, excuse me, a trillion dollars of net worth. So I think, um, you know, there's so much money that's flowing into these tech companies that I think that, you know, part of that new green deal is looking at how we redistribute funds in a, in a, in an, in a capitalist economy to push money back down to the middle class so we can afford to buy washing machines that are that are good or put windows and doors in our house that make our house more energy efficient um so those are big ideas that i think are rolled into that uh green new deal that um are worth looking at yeah obviously changes smaller big all help in the grand scheme of things when it comes to environmental change yeah. moving forward here for a different issue that's recently been in the news a lot is police reform there's mm -hmm. been a lot of talk about how policing needs to change. Has yeah. Deerfield taken approach to that, or? Yeah, well, we're lucky in Deerfield that we have a very proactive uh, police chief and a, a police department, and and a select board that really pays attention to this stuff and is involved. Um, through Chief Pachurik's leadership, um, we we do a lot of the things already that are kind of asked for in in some of the reforms that are that are out there. Um, 
I, I'm not a fan of, of um, defund the mantra of defunding police. I think that's just taking the wrong approach. I think rethinking how we police um, and always keeping an open mind to other ways that we can de-escalate situations. Um, but so as a police officer, you're dealing with really uh, split second decisions and sometimes violent issues. You know, you show up on a, on a domestic abuse case um, that can be very hard. Um, but I, and I think our, our, we need to add money to policing to offer trainings in de-escalation and, um, and I, I would love to see, you know, some of the talk has been about um, instead of funding the police department, why don't we fund mental health? And um, and and instead of that 911 call going to the police department, should it go to a mental health department? I think that's a great idea, but you have to really kind of meld the two together. And with with a con with towns like ours where we don't have funding. So how do you afford to do something like that? We could not afford as a town to have a psychologist on board ready to go to any call at any time. But I think more regionally working with FERCOG, the Franklin, um, Franklin Regional Council of Governments, maybe there's some funding or a grant possibility to have, you know, on standby at the local DA office, a, you know, um, a response team. So when there's an issue, one, you know, once the police can get it under control and know it's a safe environment, you could send in somebody that would have mental health experience or, you know, how to deal with the homeless. Because a lot of it is, you know, you see it all the time. I think in Philadelphia right now, it was a mentally, you know, person with mental health problems, you know, wielding a knife and coming at the police. So um, how do we teach to, you um, keep the police officers safe and still mitigate that threat coming to them without taking a life. And then once you, maybe that, maybe that person wasn't coming at them with a knife, but there were other obvious, obvious mental illness issues that you could have somebody there to help um, deal with those issues. So I think it's more funding and not less funding. Um, and of course there are different departments across the country that, are run much differently, right? So I'm not I'm not naive to the fact that there are, there may be some police departments across the country that um, do need some serious change and maybe some redirecting of funds. But I think as a local issue in in our local town, just knowing what I know about our our staff and our our police department and our chief, um, that's not a vision I would. I would think going forward, we live in a very safe town, but how do we make our, our persons of color, our residents of color feel safe where they are? And, um, you know, we, we have um, racism in our town, just like we do any other town. And it's not always overt racism. It's, um, it's ignorance, you know, or if it's poking fun or joking or, you know, whatever that might be that is hurtful to the person on the other side. We've got to find a way to drill that into our students and to really help them understand what they're saying um, is hurtful to people. And, pe you know, kids need to mature and understand how their actions and what they say has have an effect later on in life or during you know, some child's, you know, day. We don't know how they're dealing with stuff at home. And, you know, anything that we do to add on to that is just um, can be very hurtful to people. So we have to work harder here in our town, recognizing those issues, calling them out, education. Um, it's a it's a long road. I mean, we've this country is, you know, several hundred years old and has this has been a, a major issue for a long time. And I, I'm glad that your generation is waking up to that and demanding and pushing our generation to um, to make change in that area. Um, quick question. Do you think that our community's lack of ethnic and more so um, experience-based diversity is hurting um, its resilience to change sort of? Yeah, I think, um, you know, I think it's important to have diversity. I mean, one of the beautiful things about living in, the Pioneer Valley is its diversity um, in thought, but it, there's not uh, a huge diversity in race. So um, I think I think say Deerfield on a whole or the region on a whole would do better to have a more diverse 
uh, populace. I, I think it would help us to understand um, the plight of persons of color and what they're dealing with. Um, if you're, you know, on a board with them or going to dinner with them or neighbors with them, um, I think if, if, if anytime you live in an isolated um, bubble, you're not exposed to those um, those problems and also the beautiful things that they bring from their culture. All of the, um, whether it comes from food or their arts or their just um, train of thought or their political views, the more you can be around people that are different than you and uh, learn from them, um, the more open you are and more willing you are to stand up to say something. If you hear somebody else speak out of ignorance, you can kind of correct them. You feel stronger about that because you have a lived experience with somebody. So right. yeah, I would love to see more diversity in, in the area. All right. Two more questions here. I'm going to wrap yeah. it up. Yeah. First question, what would you say to people that may feel um, disheartened or disenfranchised with the current election that they don't feel civically motivated because they don't have a candidate that represents their, their views? That's a tough one. Um, I think it's important for them to get involved no matter what it is. If they don't feel like these two candidates um, share their voice, um, I think they should get involved with something that they can relate to. I started getting involved because my son went to school, right? He was a young kid. So I started going to the PTA. I started helping out with the fun fair, right? That was the first thing I ever did. And then I um, I started to get to know some other parents and I got involved with the school committee. And then after the school committee, I felt more comfortable to reach out and try a selectman job. And, um, and now I get to meet, you know, our local representatives, senates, you know, senators. Um, I get to know all the different select board members and board of health people in the, in the county and it, different things will, will pique somebody else's interest. But I think if they get involved in, anything it doesn't matter what it is whatever um whatever they think interests them i i really encourage them to come to a meeting get on a board speak your mind tell us your views so we understand so the people whoever they are that are in power get to hear what your view is and and if they don't um if they still don't find anybody that represents their view run for office i mean do, take it upon yourself to make be the change that you want so I, I think it, it, it really takes um, initiative on their part to tell people how they feel and what they want to see for change. And if, if, if they still don't get that, um, step up and make it make the change themselves. All right. One well, last question here. And on mm -hmm. a little bit more of a lighthearted note, we've talked about a lot sure. of very important but deep subjects here. Mm -hmm. um, are you hopeful for the future? And if so, why? I am. I am hopeful. I think... Um, I've been very dis, uh, depressed you know, personally because of how this current administration has treated our institutions from the courts to um, Department of Justice, science, um, I, I just think has been bad for just about every part of our society, um, civic society, how we come together and live together and govern together. Um, I've not been a fan of just about everything he has done. Uh, early on, I gave him that benefit of the doubt, and he has he has um, proven that I don't think he's um, up for the job to continue for four years. But I am hopeful for your generation. I'm hopeful because you have stepped up after um, you know, Parkland after, you know, seeing, you know, time after time after time, gun violence, um, your generation has stepped up and said no. After uh, police, you know, uh, the um, Floyd issue, I, and that, you know, you have, you have Floyd as a name, but there has been so many names that you can substitute for that. Um, but you, your generation has said enough and is taken to the streets. I think I somehow I feel that with the knowledge that your generation has at their fingertips that I didn't have when I was younger, um, you're so much more knowledgeable about the issues. I have a son who's in ninth grade. And I think um, when I talk to him about 
larger subjects. Um, I'm blown away at how much he does know and gets and understands. And at least, you know, with all the YouTube and all the, you know, I don't know how many different apps the kids are using today, but with all the social media that you have at your fingertip, um, I am hopeful that you at least are aware of what's going on in the world. And I am hopeful that you'll be the change. Um, I'll help is whatever I can do in our generation to help move that change along. But I do think you're more civically minded and involved. And um, I hope you don't have cynicism that you can't make a difference because you can. And um, we need to be there to help you do that. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. McDaniel, for your time. I was host Zach Lino, Frontier Decision 2020. Moderate today. I'll be asking you a couple of questions on varying issues, mostly around the political sphere. So okay. the first question we're going to start with is obviously 2020 has been a year of years, a lot of major events, coronavirus, the presidential election, so on and so forth. So what I'm going to ask you is, in the current bipartisan political environment, have you been affected at all, and if so, how? Well, I think. Uh, I think all of us have been affected by kind of the polarized atmosphere um, in this country. Um, uh, you know, um, it's been harder to get things done in a bipartisan way in Congress because, uh, you know, people have kind of taken their positions and, and have seemed unwilling to want to compromise when compromise would be a good thing in, in many cases. When I talk about compromise, I don't talk about selling your convictions. I, I talk about getting to a place where you know you feel comfortable that you got enough that you could actually vote for something that's not perfect. Um, I also think that uh, that Donald Trump has uh, created a, a a a atmosphere in this country that is really quite hostile to kind of civilized political discourse. I mean, he has used his social media, his Twitter account to promote racist, um, offensive, divisive um, you know tweets. Uh, you know, that, that really are not designed to bring us together, but are designed to pull us apart. And um, and I think this election, in many respects, is is a referendum on whether or not people would prefer something different, you know, a, a more more kind of civilized political discourse where even, with, even if people disagree, they don't have to attack each other personally. They don't have to question each other's patriotism. And um, so... So this has been a traumatic year for everybody. 
Uh, I was in a supermarket the other night, and a woman came up to me and said, make it all stop. I want it to be over with. You know, uh, make it go away. Uh, and um, and I understand that feeling uh, because it's been very, very intense. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm hoping that the election will bring some, di for some different results on Tuesday, and we can move beyond this chapter in our history. Mm -hmm. All right. Obviously, you brought up Donald Trump, the current president large election here that's happening. Do you think that coronavirus will be the number one driver for people going to the polls? Will it be the economy, social issues, or so much going on in 2020? What do you think is going to be the number one driving factor for voters going to the polls? Well, I think that obviously, you know, the coronavirus is front and center because it's, it's affecting us right now. I mean, millions and millions and millions of people have been affected. Over 230,000 people have died. Um, and we have a president who, rather than trying to unite the nation uh, uh, around efforts to control the virus and then to crush the virus and to, so we can get to the point where we can bring our economy back, we have a president who's holding super spreader events all over the country where more and more people are getting affected. So I think his mishandling of this certainly is a motivating uh, factor for people, hopefully, to vote him out of office. But I also think what's what... what uh, what is bringing a lot of people to to the polls is is a, is a desire for more decency in our government. Um, I mean, they they want you know I think they want leadership that doesn't uh, embrace the 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 worst elements in our society. I mean, uh, I think they expect to have leaders who don't coddle racists or white supremacists and you know who um, who, who try to unify the country. And um, obviously, there are some people who are going to vote for Trump, who um, you know, who are motivated, who, who actually agree with the way he's conducting himself. So that will that will motivate uh, them to to support him. But uh, you know, I uh, you know, I've been in politics for a while, and uh, you know, we have a tendency every time we get to a, in a major election to say this is the most important election of our lifetime. And I, but I really, really, really believe it uh, because it's not just about the the policies and it's it's really not it is and it's not just about the um the behavior of this president but i've also seen how he has tried to erode our democratic institutions and i'm afraid that another four years of this those institutions will be fully eroded and they'll be hard to get back i mean everything from rule of law to freedom of the press um you know those things are you know are, are also um uh, on the ballot and um, as well as the issue of the climate crisis too. I mean, we, you know, the planet before us is, is being destroyed and uh, we're not le leading in, in an effort to try to change that. All right. Um, next question here. You touched on it briefly before with social media, obviously before Americans normally got their news from either two sources, that was either the television or the newspapers. Now there's so many different social media outlets pushing different kinds of news from different angles. And it's almost serving as an echo chamber for each political ideology. How, what do you recommend for people going out into the political field, just starting? How do you tell them to navigate all the misinformation that's being spread on these social media platforms? I think people have to, make a concerted effort to educate themselves. And so uh, it's not just following somebody's, you know, blog on the internet or, you know, or following, you know, the president's Twitter account. I mean, read the New York Times. I mean, read the, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, Daily Hampshire Gazette, read the Boston Globe, read the Washington Post, uh, you know, um, listen to, you know, various uh, perspectives on the news. Uh, uh, because I think you're absolutely right. I mean, People are being fed information that is intentionally um, misleading or just not true. I mean, we have groups like QAnon right now, right? I mean, or movements like QAnon that you know are going out there and spreading this crazy, you know, these crazy conspiracy theories. Um, and some people, you know, uh, you know, and, and when you when you, when, you, when you receive that information, it doesn't say, "Hi, I'm QAnon. I'm a crazy conspiracy theory, uh, you know, movement." You know, but they they, 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 they they pitch information to people that people believe is factual, um, and then they go out and those people act on that information. You know, I'll give you an example of QAnon. I remember during the 
the, the Clinton uh, uh, Trump race, they were spreading this this uh, rumor that Hillary Clinton and John Podesta, her campaign manager, were uh, overseeing a child sex trafficking ring out of a pizza uh, restaurant in Washington, D.C. And, you know, people say, well, who's going to believe that, right? I mean, but millions and millions and millions of people, you know, um, liked it or bought into it. And then one day a guy shows up with a, uh, you know, a, a military style weapon at that very pizza place while families and their kids were having dinner. I mean, so sometimes this misinformation can lead to, to violence and, and can lead to really crazy stuff happening. So, you know, the, the short answer to your question is, I mean, we have to, we have to be aware that there are people out there trying to feed you false information. We all have to take the time to do our homework and to verify or not verify something. Yeah. All right. Um, Getting more back to the state level. What do you think is not only going to be the most pressing issue for the country, but Massachusetts? Well, look, I mean, we, we have to crush this virus, right? And, and we're seeing, you know, the um, cases going in a different direction here in Massachusetts right now. So we need to get this under control. But beyond that, look, we, we, we have an old infrastructure. In Massachusetts, we have bridges older than most of the other states in this country. Um, so we need to invest in you know, rebuilding our infrastructure, roads, bridges, our, our rail systems, our, our better modes of public transportation, our, our, our water and sewer systems are, are deteriorating. We need to invest in rebuilding schools and um, we need to invest in green, clean, renewable energy so we can wean ourselves off of fossil fuels and also deal with the issue of uh, the climate crisis. So infrastructure in general is a big part of what we need to deal with. The other thing is, look, I, um, you know, we have to understand that um, that poverty um, remains a major issue in this country. Um, I do. I, I spend a lot of time focusing on issues of food insecurity and hunger. I do a I do a, a walk every year with uh, as radio personality Monty Belmonte. Uh, we do a forty three mile walk. We we walk from Springfield to Greenfield. We walk through Deerfield, uh, as a matter of fact. Um, to raise awareness about hunger in our community, but also to raise money for the Food Bank of Western Massachusetts. You know, before this pandemic happened, uh, there, was, there, were, there were 40 million, close to 40 million people in this country who were food insecure, didn't know where their next meal was going to come from. 40 million. Um, now that is much, much higher. But think about what that means. Kids who go to school who are hungry can't learn. I mean, that, 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 that meal... Uh, that nutrition is every bit as important to that child's ability to learn as a textbook or a laptop. Um, you know, senior citizens who, you know, are told to take their medication uh, with a meal but can't afford food and their uh, their fuel or, and their rent, and so they go without and they take the medication. They end up in an emergency room. Um, you know, I, I mean, the the cost of this is enormous. So we 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 have to understand that um, you know our focus needs to be just not on the people who are well off and well connected, we have to make sure that we are bringing people out of poverty uh, so that people can have a, a decent life in this country. Um, and so that's another issue that we have to deal with here in Massachusetts and around the country. Obviously, there's been multiple attempts by the Republicans and more conservative organizations to undermine programs such as SNAP and Medicare and Medicaid, claiming that people are kind of using the system and abusing the government benefits. What is your argument to that claim? Well, first of all, on Social Security and Medicare, people pay into it all their life. Uh, so they it's a benefit that they've paid into that they not only deserve, but they've earned it. So, I mean, you know, Donald Trump gets Medicare. Uh, he gets Social Security. Uh, so the, the bottom line is, uh, you know, I, I don't really quite understand why people would question those programs. Uh, but um, on the issue of, 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 you know, food stamps or SNAP, what we call, we call it now, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, um, you know, the, the average time that somebody's on the benefit is less than a year. So people don't live their entire life on, on SNAP. And by the way, you know, to people who somehow think it's a generous benefit, I always ask them uh, to tell me what the average SNAP benefit is per person. And usually they don't know or they'll say it's very, very generous. The average SNAP benefit is about a dollar forty per person per meal. I mean, you know, I got a Dunkin' Donuts coffee this morning that uh, was more expensive than that. But that's about it. So most of the people who are on SNAP 
end up having to go to our food banks uh, midway through the month because they've run out of money to be able to put food on the table. So, look, I, you know, I think food is a fundamental human right. We live in the richest country in the history of the world that we had that before the pandemic, before the, we had close to 40 million people who didn't know where the next meal is going to come from, who were hungry. I'm ashamed of that fact. Um, you know, I mean, we, you know, we, 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 tax breaks are given to big corporations and billionaires and, you know, all, you know, and, and yet we can't afford to, you know, to make sure that everybody in this country has access to good quality nutrition. And by the way, if we get that right, you know, you'd not only help people, but you'd save a boatload of money and avoidable health care costs and kids who, you know, are not learning in school because they're food insecure. I mean, there's a whole bunch of savings to be had there. So, you know, look, it's, it's fashionable um, in Donald Trump's America to um, to not worry about the poor, uh, to diminish them, to scapegoat them. Uh, but the bottom line is um, it's awfully hard to be poor. It's hard work to be poor because, you know, you're, you're trying to figure out where, where how am I going to put food on the table? How am I going to pay my rent? How am I going to how am I going to get, you know, you know, be able to put gas in the car or can I even afford a, uh, a car to get me to a job? So um, so I don't have a lot of patience for that um, uh, because I really do think that um, uh, you know uh, that there that that we have a moral obligation uh, to worry about those um, who, who struggle and um, and we haven't been doing a very good job of that all right um, obviously in recent years you've seen a large feud between tax policies um, some saying that incentivizes free market business if you lower the tax rate for corporations and wealthy individuals. Others arguing that you need more of a progressive tax system to help make sure that the rich pay their fair share. Um, I'm curious, where do you fall in that spectrum? Well, I'm for a more progressive tax system. I, I mean, I, because the bottom line is that uh, uh, you know we, we have seen what happens when we have a uh, a, a tax system that gives more. Uh, benefits to big corporations uh, and less to those in the middle class. You know the the argument. Oh, if you if you give corporations more tax breaks, they'll create more jobs and they'll invest in the economy. Well, we we just we passed the, the uh, Congress passed unfortunately passed the Trump tax cut that did just that gave big benefits to big corporations and and billion and billionaires. In fact, we have people who don't pay taxes at all. I mean Walmart, Amazon. I mean, you know anybody who works has to pay taxes. I mean Donald Trump pay $750 a year. I don't know how he's able to do all that, but most people can't do that. It is because we have a tax structure that is uh, rigged for those at the very top. And those corporations that get that tax cut that Trump gave them, they didn't create more jobs. I mean, they bought back stock. Uh, they, they, they basically saved their money. They didn't reinvest it in workers. Uh, workers didn't see an increase in their wages. They didn't hire more workers. They didn't expand. Um, they kept it to themselves. Uh, and so, look, you know, I think everybody ought to pay their fair share. And that includes, you know, the millionaires and the billionaires and the corporations. The fact that corporations, you know, that that they get government subsidies or get government grants and government contracts can get away with paying nothing in federal taxes. That's just that's crazy to me. And it's just not fair. Uh, you know, the people who need the most help are struggling at the bottom or in the middle. Uh, the people who can afford to pay a little bit more are at the top. And um, so, you know, this laissez-faire, you know, free market at any cost, you know, we'll just give more and more breaks to the well-connected and well-off and they'll take care of the rest of us. It just doesn't work. And we've seen that. All right. We're going to shift over a little bit more to the energy side of things. I've been focusing a lot here on the economy. Energy ties into that in a large degree. Obviously, you support green energy and aspects such as the Green New Deal. Critics have come out and claimed that the Green New Deal is going to cost trillions of dollars and destroy the economy since we are such a fossil fuel-based nation, claiming that you're going to put tens of thousands of coal mine workers and gas plant workers out of business. What's the counterclaim to that? Well, first of all, people who make these exaggerated claims about the Green New Deal haven't read the Green New Deal. I mean, it's a couple of pages long and um, and it's basically an aspirational document about goals that we should have. So but that, that's number one. Number two, um, you know, um, 
we need to transition away from fossil fuels to greener, cleaner, renewable energy. Coal is like one of the worst forms of fossil fuel energy that exists. We, you know, we see countries like China and India relying more on coal and their emissions, carbon emissions, you know, going through the roof. The fact that we were, we've been weaning off of coal and now Trump wants to get us back on the coal is the step backwards. I mean, surely we ought to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time. So if we move forward, you know, cleaner energy, we ought to be able to help these workers who worked in, you know, in the coal industry or the oil industry or the gas industry, you know, transition their jobs into other areas. By the way, you know, here's a little secret that a lot of people don't talk very much about. Big oil already knows what the, the, that the future is toward greener, cleaner, renewable energy. And they are already trying to transition many of their operations into that field because, again, for them, you know, um, it's about money. Um, and, you know, and they see that the future uh, is going to demand a, a, a cleaner environment. The final thing I'm going to say is, look, we're destroying the planet. I mean, and it's costly. Um, you know, uh, you know, sea levels are rising. You're having more coastal cities, you know, basically um, flooded and, and they have to have, um, you know, uh, climate uh, crisis action plans in place to deal with that. Uh, you have these wildfires that are more intense than and any other time in world history, in California and in Colorado, you have hurricanes with such intensity, uh, the likes of which we have never seen in our lifetime. I mean, all this is has to do with changing climate and the way this planet is warming. So we have a, a choice. We can either can ignore it and continue to, uh, you know, suffer the ill effects of that, more disease, uh, more destruction of, of, of property, um, you know, warmer weathers, more intense storms, and so on and so on. And by the way, uh, you know, we, 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 you know, people talk a lot about immigration. We have climate refugees now. People come from Central America who, whose land is no longer, uh, you know, fit to grow anything. So we could either, we could either, you know, um, try to, to, to go in a direction to save this planet, create more jobs, you know, benefit the health and well-being of everybody. Or we can continue the same old, same old. I think what the Green New Deal um, promises is actually an exciting future. We're going to protect the planet. We're going to create more jobs. You know, we're going to protect the health and well-being of people all around the world. Why is that such a bad idea? I don't get it. Um, and these people who continue to, to deny that we have a climate crisis, my, my, my suggestion is they ought to go back to school. And when I say go back to school, it's not college or high school or middle school. You've got to go back to elementary school where we were told that science is important. Uh, that's what my elementary school teachers taught me. They were right. Uh, I'm not a scientist. We've got to listen to the scientists. All right. Very important point there. Um, so shifting more over to the pseudo-future side of it, do you think America could serve as a trailblazer? in the green energy revolution if a candidate such as Joe Biden wins the presidential election this year? Or do you think that it's more of about mutual cooperation with the rest of the world and less a competition with a, uh, economic superpowers such as China? Well, it's both, right? It's both. I mean, one is, uh, you know, uh, we need to lead the world by example. And Joe Biden has a climate uh, uh, crisis plan that is probably the most ambitious of any past president. All right. I mean, you know, I mean, so it is, it is good. Is it, is it as bold as I would like it to be? No, I'd like it bolder, but you know what? You can't get everything. So this is a major step in the right direction and it is worth fighting for because it will make a difference. So that's number one. We, and we need to be on the cutting edge of creating new green technologies here in the United States. Cause I, quite frankly, I want to create more jobs here and I want us to be the exporter of whatever, it is that we are making to make the environment uh, better and cleaner. And so let's, let's invest and let's, let's lead the world, right? The second thing is we need to work with the rest of the world. That's why we need to get back into the Paris Climate Accord, uh, which uh, this president took us out of, because then we, have, we can work with China and India, uh, but not just with those big countries. A lot of the smaller countries that do not have the resources to adapt to this new transition toward a, a greener world. We need to help provide them the resources so that they can uh, adapt uh, and be part of the solution as well. So 
we need to we need to act local, you know, uh, in, 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 within our country, but we also need to lead globally as well. All right, wonderful answer. <clears throat> Shifting over more towards um, a foreign policy perspective, obviously America has retracted a lot of its historic relationships it's had with countries for decades now, Trump pulling out and demanding more funding for countries in the NATO agreement, um, criticizing relationships abroad in Asia, um, shifting directions more towards relationships with Russia, um, historic nemesis of America through the Cold War. Do you think that this switching of alliances and um, new deals Trump's making is going to hurt America's reputation on the global stage, or do you think it could garner a new type of foreign policy? Well, it already has hurt America's reputation um, in the world community, and um, and I don't and I don't. But when I think of a, a foreign policy that I want the United States of America to pursue, it's not one that coddles, um, you know, dictators like Kim Jong Un of uh, North Korea, who's one of the worst murderers in the in, on the planet, or who um, cozies up to Vladimir Putin who's one of the most corrupt and brutal leaders uh, on the planet, or who uh, turns a blind eye when the government of Saudi Arabia um, murders and then dismembers a Washington Post journalist or, or, or takes weapons that we have provided them and uses them in a, in a brutal war against the people of Yemen where they're bombing school buses and weddings and funerals or, um, you know, I mean, so what, my critique, major critique of the Trump foreign policy is that it has totally moved us away from any commitment to human rights. And I think the centerpiece of any U.S. foreign policy ought to be human rights. If we stand for anything, we need to stand out loud and foursquare for human rights. Uh, and that means we need to be a voice for those who are being persecuted, for those who are struggling to be able to, you know, to be free, to be able to to be able to determine their own future, uh, to be able to, you know, be who they are, to worship the way they want to, to be uh, openly, uh, you know, uh, proud of being in the LBGTQ community, to be, you know, to be able to, you know, to be able to be whoever they want to be. Um, and so, um, uh, so I, 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 I hope that if we get a new president, as Joe Biden, that there is a return to human rights. Yeah, yeah we, we want to deal with we want, we want to have a, a, a constructive relationship with Russia and China. Uh, but here's the deal. We're also going to bring up the issue of human rights every chance we get. And we're going to come up with creative sanctions to target those individuals in those countries who are responsible for human rights uh, crimes against their own people. But, you know, I, I mean, our the founding of this country was, you know, basically on the premise that people wanted to move away from the you know the, the, the uh, you know the the strong arm of the of of, of the uh, of the crown in England, and yet you know here we are in in 2020 where you know you know Trump's deal is very he tries very tra transactional. If you buy more soybeans from our farmers, well then you know what I'm going to turn up China. I won't I won't say anything about the fact that you are putting Uyghur Muslims in concentration camps, or that you're trying to crush a a democratic uh, movement in Hong Kong. Uh, I, I, I don't, that, that's very cynical to me, and that's not who I want us to be. All right, a quick point to make there. Many people, especially foreign politicians, um, point out that America has a deep-seated hypocrisy with trying to be the police of the world, with toppling democratically elected leaders in foreign countries and escalating wars, especially in the Middle East. And most recently, this last decade, with escalation of drone strike usage under Obama and Trump has skyrocketed, often killing innocent civilians. Do you think America has a leg to stand on when pointing out um, foreign human rights violations when America itself has committed atrocities abroad? Yeah, so America has, has done some not so nice things in the past. Um, and I opposed uh, Obama's drone policy. Um, and I opposed... Uh, you know Bush's war in Iraq, and I and uh, so I mean I, you know we we go through that that whole history. But here's the deal: um, when when our you, you know when, you know, and I oppose Bush's torturing of people in Guantanamo Bay. But here's the deal: when our country goes in the wrong direction, all of us who believe that that it, we're moving in the wrong direction have an obligation to speak out and to demand change. That's what patriotism is. It's, you know, that we love our country so much that when it makes mistakes, we're going to stand up and we're going to point it out and we're going to demand change. 
that doesn't mean that we that, that we should be silent if people are being you know persecuted in China or in Russia or people are being murdered in Saudi Arabia or judges or journalists are being jailed in Turkey or you know innocent people are being killed in Duterte's Philippines. Um, so look, my view is I look at myself as you know as as a citizen of this country who you know when my country does something I like I'll applaud it. When my country does something wrong, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna raise a critical voice. To remain silent, if your country is doing something wrong, by the way, is not patriotism; it's moral cowardice. So we have an obligation to constantly make our country better. Um, but at the same time, we also have to be a, a reassuring voice to people around the world um, who are being persecuted for you know for for you know for who they are. Um, we have to be there and let them know that we are watching. And I don't, I'm, not, I'm not saying, I'm, and by the way, I'm, I, I would not, the way you, you know, when I criticize China on human rights doesn't mean I want to topple the Chinese government or I want to overthrow the Russian government. That The people of Russia and the people of China should do that. We, that I don't, being policemen of the world, if that means overthrowing governments, that's not what we're here for. But on the other hand, we need to stand with people who are on the right side of history. We need to we need to we need to be there when there were legitimate democratic movements and movements for human rights and for human dignity and say, look at, you know, we stand with you. We think we think we share that, we share those values. I think that's very, very important. All right. I'm shifting over. We're running a little bit out of time here, but we still have time for a few more questions. I like to shift to the more policy of immigration. Um, obviously recently Trump's been in Canada all about immigration, whether it's the border wall in Mexico or family separations. Trump has engaged in some of the more aggressive immigration policies in recent American history. Do you think that America as a whole is going to kind of turn to that subject as a blind eye or neglect it on the ballot box this year, or is it still going to remain as a sore subject to many Americans? Well, look, um, you know, um, I think we need to fix our immigration laws uh, to make it uh, uh, to make it more accessible accessible for people who want to come here uh, and, and join our community. I believe that we need to uh, follow our own laws with regard to asylum. If you are seeking asylum, if you're in fear for your life, if you're fearing persecution, if you get sent back under our laws, you can present yourself at the border and you're supposed to be given a hearing. Trump has not been uh, living up to that law, so we've been breaking the law. I believe when people come here that we shouldn't separate their children from their parents. I think that's cruel. I think it's a human rights violation. If any other country did what this administration did, we would be before the United Nations demanding a, a, a independent investigation into all of that. Look, um, we're a nation of immigrants. I mean, um, you know, my I, I could trace my ancestry on my father's side back to Ireland and my mother's side back to Poland. I don't have any Native American blood in me. Um, and I do know that the history of this country is that we basically stole land uh, from the Native American population who was indigenous to this continent, right? So we are all immigrants uh, when we trace our, our, our history back, unless you're a Native American. Uh, and, um, and, you know, and, and we are unique in the world because we are a nation of immigrants and we have great diversity in this country, and we should celebrate that. I think what has happened uh, with Trump is that he has turn that diversity into something that is not desirable. Um, and there is, there are, you know, there's the, it, it, and his comments are tinged with, with racism and bigotry that, you know, um, that reinforce prejudices that some people in this country have. Um, I mean, he's talked about Muslim bans and he's talked about Mexicans as rapists and as whole countries. And, you know, I mean, I go on and on and on. Um, I, it makes me very, very sad um, to hear that. Um, you know, I was a history major in college. And I always believed that people should have a, a sense of history. I think that's a good thing to have, as you, especially if you're in politics. But when you look back on our history, I mean, the 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 the, uh, the, the, the moments that we cringe at when we look at our history is is oftentimes is the way we treated newcomers who have come to this country. Um, and uh, and the, these very people who come to this country, who help build our country up, are the ones we we, we so mistreated. So let's let, let's let, let let let's stop referring to anybody as illegal. No person is illegal. 
Um, let's start treating every human being with respect. We can do that and, and have orderly immigration at the same time. Um, we have to stop demagoguing the issue. All right. We're going to shift over to one of our two last questions of the day here. <clears throat> Obviously, a new social, almost civil rights movement has erupted in 2020 after the tragic killing of George Floyd, an you know, armed black man in Minnesota for the knee of Derek Chauvin. Um, it's created this movement around the country that has almost been politicized by the media and has been covered in multiple different lights, multiple. <clears throat> often portraying the protesters as angry writers and looters. Do you think this rhetoric is damaging towards people's perception of the Black Lives Matter movement and civil rights reform in the country? I, I think I think the people who, who say falsely that uh, you know the majority of people who are protesting are looters or rioters uh, that is that is an attempt to try to damage them. I, I'm, I, I hope and pray that most people see through that. But look, Black Lives Matter is a noble movement. I mean, it is a movement about you know equality and civil rights. It's a continuation of the civil rights uh, movement. Um, and um, and the bottom line is that um, you know we have a problem with racism in this country, uh, and we have a problem with systemic racism in this country. And for whatever reason, it we, we don't want to talk about it. People get very defensive. I always tell people that, you know, when, you know, we show, well, there's no such thing as systemic racism. Well, you know, our, our, our prisons are overpopulated with communities of color. Um, you know, you, you, you may remember that, that one guy who shot a protester, this white guy who shot a protester, and, and then he walked by the police with a, with a assault weapon, and everybody said hi to him as he went by. Um, if that were a black man, there's no way that he would have gotten too feet never mind walk by the police just, just, just to be clear you're referring to Kyle Rittenhouse correct uh, yeah I'm referring to Kyle Rittenhouse that's correct yeah and um, you know I mean the bottom line is is that um, uh, you know um, so so here's the deal systemic racism means that our some of our systems are inherently racist doesn't mean that everybody who's in that system is a screaming racist it means that over time, these institutions have developed in a way that have disproportionately disadvantaged communities of color. We need to fix that. And we need to be able to have these conversations. That's why I'm for a, a, a police reform bill in, in Congress uh, to try to, you know, to do take some steps for more transparency and more accountability. States all around the country are moving in that direction. But that that... That somehow in the year 2020, it is still controversial in some quarters to talk about really ridding this country of racism is really astounding to me. Um, it, you know, it shows that notwithstanding the strides that we have made, you know, over the years, that we still have a long way to go. And by the way, when we talk about systemic racism, it's not just law enforcement, and it's not, and we should not be just. And this is not meant to disparage everybody who's in law enforcement because there's some very there's some incredible people in our law enforcement who put their lives in the line to protect their communities. But it's also in our education system. Uh, it's it's in terms of healthcare disparities. You saw this during the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, you know, some people who did not have access to good care are based on their the living in poverty. They were more apt to get the the, the virus. It's in our business community. Most of the CEOs in this country are not community representatives of communities of color they're all white so we, we 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 ought to have this discussion and we ought to figure out how we move forward to get to a point where we can rid ourselves of this terrible uh, scourge of racism all right one quick question and we'll move on to our final point here of the night obviously there's been a big push for police accountability and more training would you support an initiative to support um, more police training in dealing with people with mental health issues or disabilities? Yeah, I, but I would also think that this is a time to reimagine the role of the police, right? So if somebody, you know, if, 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 if somebody's responding to an issue that really is a mental health crisis, you know, is is a police officer the best person to respond to that? Or should we have a, a, a healthcare professional who is, you know, more sensitive to the challenges of somebody who may be, battling with mental health issues, uh, would that be a better way to do it? So, I mean, yeah, look, training is, is important, but we also have to ask ourselves, you know, uh, you know, you know, 
is it is the right person to respond to a particular situation a police officer if it is fine if it isn't maybe we ought to be thinking of other approaches and so um, you know this is also a time for us to have open discussions about what we want our police force to look like and are, and are we asking too much of them when we have you know police responding to health mental health crisis police are responding to you know incidents in schools or you know truancy issues and I mean there's you know maybe maybe there are better approaches to some of these things but that's something we we ought to have a, a community-wide discussion on and figure out how we want to move forward but the All one right. thing one thing is clear the, the status quo is not acceptable anymore All right. uh, moving on to our last question more of a lighthearted note to end on obviously you've accomplished a lot you've pushed for a lot of very progressive policies in washington dc two-parter question are you hopeful for the future and what are your future initiatives you're gonna be pushing for so yeah i am hopeful for the future um and i'm hopeful for the future uh, in part because i i talk to a lot of young people like you and others who who are interested in politics and interested in the future of this country and interested in creating a better world um you know on the issue of the of climate change i some of the most in, incredible meetings i've had in the last couple of years have been with you know, high school students. Um, and uh, and so I, I think there's a greater awareness amongst younger people today than there was when I was young. Uh, so I, I am hopeful about that. And I believe in the goodness of the American people. I believe people are essentially good. We just have to bring that goodness out and uh, and things will, will change. And um, and the final, it was the, what was the final question? It was the uh, what, what are wanted, you going to be pushing for in the future? Yeah, yeah. and I know, and I, you know, and look, I mean, uh, there's a lot I want to do. I mean, you know, I, I, you know, if depending on how this election works out, if things work out the way I want to, then we need to move on forward on an infrastructure bill, on 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 a bill to deal with climate change, on a bill to get money out of politics, because I think that's a corrupting influence in uh, in our politics. We need to expand healthcare protections. I'm for Medicare for all. I think that would be the way we should go. We need to, you know, get a voting rights, strengthen the Voting Rights Act and, and get a police reform bill uh, put forward. And and again, I, I do a lot of work on hunger. I, I want to I want to invest more in in, in, in trying to create a, a, a plan in this country that will not just manage hunger and food insecurity, but will actually end it. Um, and I want to see a foreign policy that is more focused on human rights, that is more focused on ending issues like hunger and extreme poverty. I think those are the things that, uh, to me, represent the values of the country, of this country as I see it, as, as I want to see it. And, uh, and, uh, I, I, and I think it's important for us, for us all to uh, not ever get weary uh, and to not give up and to not give in and uh, to keep fighting the good fight. All right. Well, thank you, Congressman McGovern, for joining us tonight. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for Discussing on election night, obviously it's going to be a big one, hoping for different outcomes, but either way, we hope that the president accepts the outcome and that democracy remains strong in America. I Thank do you. too. Thank you.